You are listening to Cemetery Confessions, the world's number one goth talk podcast. Hello and welcome back to Cemetery Confessions. This month, uh, we're doing things a bit differently. Instead of going over current news and reviewing an album and the other kind of normal segments on the show, we're instead going to be reading a 10-hour audiobook for your entertainment. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, (laughs) This might actually be a bigger show than normal, but we're going to be dedicating the entire show to discussing a recently released book called Post-Millennial Gothic, Uh, by Catherine Spooner. Uh, So a bit about Catherine Spooner before we get into introductions here. If you don't know, um, she's a professor of literature and culture at Lancaster University and has written several books on the topic of the Gothic and its crossover with goth. Uh, Those include Fashioning Gothic Bodies and Contemporary Gothic, both of which I am a fan of. Uh, And if you would like to check those out or purchase them, I will have links in the show notes. Uh, But otherwise, you might have seen her on uh, the BBC. Um, She does lectures and hosts exhibitions on the Gothic uh, and a bunch of cool stuff like that over in England, if that's where you're at. So uh, before we jump into the discussion of this book, because there is a lot to discuss here, uh, I, of course, am the Count. And as always, I'm here with my co-host, Mark. Hello, Mark. Hello there. Uh, and our guests this month are some of the finest critical minds the show has ever seen. Uh, Trey, hello, Trey. Welcome back. Hello, Count. Thank you for having me, as always. And uh, Natalie, who is our resident uh, literature expert, who's going <laughs> to be bringing uh, a much-needed perspective to the conversation, I think. So, Natalie, welcome back. Thank you. I'm glad to be back. I'm excited. <laughs> So, yeah, I guess we'll do a brief introduction here for any first-time listeners or uh, anyone who hasn't uh, heard either of you on the show recently. If you want to just a a brief kind of who you are and what you do and whatever you want to tell us about yourselves. Trey, why don't you go first? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm Trey. I've been on here a number of times. I really am not much of a producer of things, so I don't have a, a Twitter or Pinterest or Tumblr or any of that to, to direct you to. I mostly just am a member of the local Chicago scene that I share with Daniel and a number of other people. And so I go out to nights and I try to be a supporter of the scene. Um, I've been involved in one degree or another with the Gothic subculture since oh, right around the mid 90s. So, you know, through college, I had a couple of stints as a DJ at a couple of club nights and then a couple of private events as well. And then I've also been a member of local club scenes in central Illinois, Colorado, and Chicago area. All right, I'm Natalie, and right now I am a, a frequent participant of the Denver area scene. I've only been here about two years, but I've been involved with the goth community since I was like, I guess about 18 years old. Um, but I was without a scene for most of that until now. Um, I am also a writer. You can find me on Twitter. <laughs> I don't have an author page yet. I'll hopefully have that soon. Um, as far as the Denver scene goes, I am part of Sanctum Noir, which is the gothic fusion belly dance group here we're about to have our very first performance next month yeah and, um, I saw that. <laughs> yeah it's it's gonna be fun i'm excited and also terrified because it's very much out yeah. of my normal thing which is yeah. writing which you do by yourself and it's very quiet and um except for when we're at uh gatherings pretty much something you do by yourself um i also have a master of fine arts in creative writing which i got a couple of years ago I have a bachelor's, bachelor's as well, but the MFA is definitely a little bit more of the reason why I'm here because I, mm. um, I write horror, uh, which I do separate from Gothic as the author does. Um, but I uh, did a lot on vampires <laughs> the entire time I was there. My thesis yeah. was the first half of the vampire novel. I did a big uh, 
lecture on it, and that was also the reason why I was on here before. Uh, and I cannot wait for an hour. <laughs> I can't wait to hear what you have to say about the vampires in this book. Uh, yeah, it's. <laughs> I'm so excited. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's not jump ahead of it. I'm really excited. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, well, and I guess first of all, just for anyone listening, I apologize for my voice. I have a, a cold I'm struggling with right now. So uh, if you can't understand what I'm saying, hopefully uh, it's not too bad, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll get through it. So a bit of, a bit of backstory <clears throat> about why we're doing this book. Um, I actually mentioned it on the show probably about a year and a half ago before it was released. Uh, and thought the the kind of synopsis sounded interesting. And uh, as I got closer to being released, I reached out to Catherine Spooner and Bloomsbury, who published the book and requested a review copy. The, the book review, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of uh, go through chapter by chapter and try to focus on the main themes. Um, I'm trying to, to keep this relevant mostly to goth subculture. Um, so we will leave out some some topics that aren't related. Uh, we might over might skip over some stuff for time. Um, specifically, I wanted to mention there's a really interesting commentary on um, the nature of the humanities and what kind of implicit uh, value or utilitarian purpose it has uh, and kind of how we determine what value that has to, to academic pursuits. Um, but for the purpose of this podcast, we're going to focus on the stuff that will be relevant to, to goths and uh, what we're interested in. So the main theme of this book uh, concerns itself with the perceived rise of what she terms as the happy Gothic. Um, and there's several other claims we'll get into later but the 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 locus is around this post-millennial happy gothic so i have a, a, a little piece at the end of the book where i think kind of nicely sums up her thesis uh just to lay that out so she says in defining this new gothic as happy i do not seek to homogenize a very diverse range of texts Rather, I seek to suggest that the long-standing associations between gothic and comedy and romance have become foregrounded with the effect of producing texts that recognizably engage with gothic themes and or visual style, but do so with a sense of lightness, playfulness, comfort, joy, or even euphoria. There is more than one kind of happiness, just as there is more than one kind of gothic. What unites the majority of my examples is a sense of celebration. This celebratory attitude is reflected in and cued by a visible public culture of enjoyment of Gothic texts. The Gothic exhibitions and festivals and films uh, and academic conferences that have proliferated since the millennium are not gloomy affairs, but are full of fun and entertainment. Participants unite to celebrate the genre they love. Um, and I thought that kind of nicely sums up her thesis, her overall thesis for the book. So uh, we'll jump right in here. We're going to find ourselves in uh, chapter one, the introduction, and she begins laying out the general themes of the book by positioning gothic media as, like I said, no longer universally gloomy and miserable or even scary, uh, and talks about her term happy gothic as a, kind of a capacious and broad umbrella for the artifacts that are associated with positive emotions um, which she says had previously been uh, unexpected in conventional Gothic discourse. And interestingly, uh, we kind of talked about this on Facebook a bit, but she preempts a critical dismissal of these happier forms of Gothic as inauthentic, because uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of academic uh, discussion around that, um, or watered down uh, by saying that these claims of traditional authenticity miss out on the way that culture uses gothic narratives for aesthetics in contemporary consumption and contemporary consumption is a theme of a later chapter but um, it's something she builds on of course and uh what i'm curious here without getting really into the authenticity element of it um because we will talk about that later but if you think that this preemption of inauthenticity is transferable to um, the discourse around goth identity uh, and ephemera 
or if if it's just like two separate because there's a lot of that discussion in uh in goth circles as well um and i'm curious if that if her kind of argument translates over i mean i'm i'm all for uh genres and storytelling evolving so i have um no issue with the stories that she, uh, most of the stories that she mentions and this being called gothic um because mm. the, she sets out a very clear lineage with um how they evolved and reacted to each other and i do think genres do expand and evolve and it also it reflects how people understand storytelling um, our storytelling, I think, in general, has become more complex since um, the sort of classic Gothic era of like uh, the Victorian era. Um, yeah. So it makes sense to me that it would diversify like this. Um, as far as like the authenticity argument with goth, I'm not, it's kind of hard to really apply that. Like there's the genre and then there's the culture because genres are going to be applied to products like. Mm. movies books television shows but the culture is applied to people and i feel like that's a little bit it's a little bit different and it's kind of hard to there is connect a, them there is a debate yeah. around what makes a goth identity or goth culture authentic mm -hmm. or not or some people say it's you can't quantify it and that kind of gets into the you yeah. know what is goth and how do we determine that uh but her i guess her argument specifically is it misses out on the way that the Gothic is used uh, in contemporary consumption. And if we apply that to goth, um, I think that could be an interesting lens because that kind mm -hmm. of goes with lifestyle, which the way lifestyle is used in this book is a, uh, the, the products that we consume. Yeah. Um, and so I think that could be an interesting way to inspect authenticity uh but I, I think as well as part of my problem with this book is it misses out on a lot of what makes up goth culture yeah and the um, background of it because what i was thinking the whole time there's like one point and it was kind of skipping ahead where she's like well it's unclear whether goths were always this way and i was like i literally wrote in the margin you could ask us <laughs> like <laughs> you know and i was kind of like so i feel like she's looking at it from kind of that exterior lens this is the how the mainstream portrays us and views us has certainly yeah. evolved but whether we've changed it's kind of hard to say a little yeah. bit harder to say i think i mean you don't even need to i mean it would be best to ask you know someone who's a member of the subculture but you don't even need to there's a wealth of just stuff the subcultures produce between exactly. music and yes. interviews and magazine articles Books. and they've got people yeah. of from <laughs> all eras of the history of yeah. the goth subculture discussing what goth means to them or just you know the lyrics of the songs lyrical mm -hmm. content has an aspect that reflects on the attitude of the culture and what's interesting and engaging to people who view themselves as members of the yeah. culture or at least what members of the culture have deemed reflective of their own experience even if the producer of that content will disavow their claim to goth mm -hmm. i think also like i think the reason she can kind of say these is because she's looking that make that statement is because she's looking at it through a very specific lens not just she's looking at it at the sort of like finished products of goth and gothic and where they are currently and she also specifically said i'm not looking at so at this from like a sociological point of view she said she admitted she kind of overlooked the music and stuff like that and that could i think looking at the music would mm. definitely make it more apparent that the early scene was a little more whimsical and silly than we are now yeah. <laughs> i think sometimes i think there was a discussion on the show once about whether we the current scene takes itself too seriously um is that correct yeah. Like, yeah yeah so um but yeah i mean the books and everything that's been written about it you know i yeah, there's she could have looked into it, but she kind of like she probably had a page limit with this. And so she probably was like, OK, I'm going to focus on what I know. And yeah. I'm looking so at, yeah, so it makes sense from her perspective. But from ours, it, we're like, there's all this information you should have looked at. That, like, <laughs> yeah, but we'll get in like yeah. mes message boards, Reddit forums. Yeah, and just yeah. all different mm -hmm. resources. We're simply not having mentioned it because it was very much an aside. She could have left it out entirely. Mm -hmm. yeah she could have left us out of this entirely yeah she absolutely <laughs> I mean, could. well i mean just that one comment too 
where she said, well, I don't really know much about it. Well, why did you say <laughs> something even briefly? Mm -hmm. She kind of does that throughout the book, though, um, with goth specifically. But we'll, get, we'll get, into that. Yeah. get into that. So uh, where, she spends... We're yeah. this. It's, hey, it's her book. Yeah. She can say whatever mm -hmm. she wants. Uh, so <laughs> she spent some time discussing why the gothic today is not solely the result of social anxieties or trauma. Um, and that the humanities have traditionally focused on the reactionary and the negative, and that the study of the Gothic as working out anxieties was a response to the Gothic being viewed by critics as less intellectual. Um, and this was a move to position the Gothic as worthy of research in academia, um, not just as, instead of just as a genre that is an evocation of pleasurable fear. Uh, and I, I guess I don't really have any thoughts on that because I've never studied or kept up with the Gothic as it's presented in, in the Academy, but, um, I think, yeah, I don't know if anybody has thoughts. About that. Yeah. <laughs> like, Cause I'm, I'm coming from a kind of a different point of view here. Cause in, in, in creative writing, as opposed to English literature, you focus on craft and like how it's, how it's structured, not necessarily what it means. So we, you know, and obviously we're in academia too, but we're like the people making it versus the people looking at it and enjoying it and trying to figure out what it, what its purpose is. Um, and so for me, like reading through this intro, I was like, yeah, you're, you're right on here. Cause I yeah, like one of the reasons yeah. that I kind of stayed away from English literature is because they're, they're like, we have to analyze what it means, what it symbolizes. They focus on older literature without really like moving forward to any time now. So I was like, I was like, I like that she said the stuff that, you know, a lot of the the dismissal of popular stuff and what ends up happening is you end up overlooking um, stuff that's not, and it's not, you know, about whether it's, you end up overlooking recent books and such that are brilliant. <laughs> and like, there's kind of like, I almost felt like English teachers are sometimes kind of scared, scared to be like, somebody hasn't like approved this through the like English lit cabal first to like mm. decide that this is like good or something. And I'm like, well, you can decide it's good yourself and you can decide that it has meaning or purpose or that it reflects something. And um, I did like how she talked about how with like uh, Twilight and all those, how a lot of the dismissal was coming from criticizing what young women like and while there are problematic things about that book from a feminist point of view, from a craft point of view, um, a lot of the criticism that was lobbed against it was definitely thinly veiled young female hate. And mm. so I, I fully agreed with that. And, um, yeah. you know, just because it's new and popular does not mean that it's not worthy of consideration, you know, because there's some there's some really quality stuff out there right now. And some of it's popular, some of it's indie, you know there's no reason to overlook it. So I just, uh, and I like that she throughout the book kind of looks at both the major level and the like kind of more independent level as well, or like ones that were not quite as successful, but still notable in some way. So I liked that she really did the, looked at it through the contemporary lens and like created a, almost a lineage for it, um, going back to like that classic era that everyone harkens back to when they talk about gothic literature <laughs> so yeah 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 and, and to her point there's always kind of been a tension within academic circles between the literary fiction that is meant to be taken seriously from mm -hmm. an academic standpoint and what's usually sort of passed off as genre fiction yeah and absolutely. that includes gothic that includes horror sci-fi mm -hmm. fantasy crime novels mystery novels mm -hmm. all of that that's not you know, that sort of slice of life, true to world or literary fiction that's trying to say something is usually written off. Yeah. And that's been a great source of frustration for many authors who for do sure. have things to say, but just because it's put in this, you know, in this package of, you know, a fantasy world or a gothic world, it's automatically dismissed and it's not mm -hmm. really taken, you know, oh, given any I, real attention. I, yeah, that's, that's such a big thing that actually made it... Um, there, when I was applying for MFA programs, there were a very, there's tons of MFA programs in the country. There's a like tiny number that actively seek genre fiction. So that sort of 
does carry over into the sort of writer end of academia as well as the like more analytical end and so like uh, the person who heads the mfa program that i went to is a crime writer and so he's like totally open to um you know genre fiction and he has a guy there who does just genre like science fiction fantasy and horror and that's very unusual to see that kind of support mm. and i was really lucky that I got in and got to go there. And what's even better is the genre professor, um, Stephen, writes horror. He mainly writes horror. So that was like perfect for me. <laughs> I was so lucky. <laughs> but yeah, um, and that, that's so very unusual. So before we get out of the, uh, the introduction here, I want to read one quote uh, that I thought was interesting and I have something to say about. So uh, let's see. So this quote, where is it? Here we go. So she says, uh, it is also worth pointing out that this is on page 21 in the middle. I don't know if anyone's paying attention to that, but uh, it's also worth pointing out that one of the things that interests me most about the relationship between goth subculture and gothic culture is what happens when goth images or aesthetics enter the mainstream or are appropriated by cultural producers and audiences who are not current participants in the subculture. Subcultural studies, for obvious and entirely justifiable reasons, are mostly concerned with the practices and identities of subcultural participants. Within subcultures, there is often a derogatory vocabulary applied to bands who are considered to have sold out, or participants who consume the subculture as a temporary lifestyle option, uh, like weekenders, part-time punks, and so on. But just because an image is appropriated by what, for want of a better term, I will call the mainstream, does not mean that it stops signifying. The way goth features in TV adverts, big budget films, or high street fashions can in itself be complex and revealing, particularly when it comes to exploring how gender constructions play out in contemporary culture. While I, I like that kind of disclaimer there, uh, I think it starts to raise this question of whether or not the appropriated mainstream version of goth actually matters for uh, subculturalists or impacts them in any way. Um, just today, well, I guess this is kind of a tangent, but it kind of relates back to authenticity, but I was reading on Reddit, someone was saying that uh, goth dress is only an outward expression of a music genre um and in this paragraph and the one before it she's talking about how there is a distinct social identity and uh there's complexity uh and people are still arguing about um you know it's, they literally said uh you can't count dark and spooky ephemera as part of goth because they are so beloved by the mainstream <laughs> uh which brings up that question of where the discourse between goth culture and mainstream culture and that appropriation back and forth impacts how we view ourselves. I think like, I think it's fine as long as members of the subculture make a distinction between, you know, like in earlier podcasts, I would always uh, dis make a distinction between goth and gothic. Hmm. And that's, I think that's kind of what the author does here too, because um, I, I picked up on that when I heard you uh, quoting her. But yeah, I, I think the two can coexist as long as, you know, it's understood that they are distinct from one another, and you can, you can be into goth culture and enjoy gothic things like, you know, certain movies. Uh, music genres, what have you, that aren't necessarily within the confines of goth culture. And I think that's fine, uh, but just at least in my case, it is kind of an understood distinction. Yeah, and I mean, it was interesting because the it, it was weird to me for someone to say that you can't... Uh, only Goth can only be music because the mainstream culture uses uh the gothic to in their in their films and their movies and their the the stuff they consume um which kind of 
made me think, well, so if the mainstream started using goth music then uh, in all of their media, would that then mean that that couldn't signify goth culture? Because it was... Because it kind of positions goth as a completely reactionary yeah, it's not the culture. It's not its presence in mainstream media. That's th that's sometimes the problem. It's the way it's presented sometimes. Like for me, I don't know about with you guys, but if I'm reading a book or watching something, and a really stereotypical goth character uh, walks onto the page or onto the screen, I get kicked out because I just can't believe that person is real. <laughs> you know, like it's just <laughs> for me. It's like to me, it's like a a failure to. It's like there's a lot of talk in the literary community about what you what to do if you're portraying a character whose um, cultural identity or um, I guess is different than yours and what you have to do to prepare for that and how you want to put it into the text. And, you know, of course, like it's mainly focused on like gender, sexual orientation, race um ethnic culture religious culture uh but subculture is not really brought up <laughs> um and i kind of feel yeah. like there's not i don't see that like careful concern either reflected in a lot of the that's pr um put out there for subculture and i i sometimes wonder if it's because some people are still not really aware of it being a culture <laughs> and not just like clothes and music um mm. and so for me it's like you don't want to if you're portraying a goth character you don't want to make them like the the loudspeaker of goth culture you kind of i feel like you could use the same techniques that people are telling you to if you want to portray a different ethnicity than yours this is how you're going to do it um you know but i don't see that careful concern i see people even really good writers drawing on just absolutely repetitive flat stereotypes and to me it's not that it's like not good writing is what i'm trying to say yeah. <laughs> so it's like no i had i had sure. someone ask me yeah uh earlier today if where i thought goth the relationship between goth and the mainstream would go in the future and i basically said that i didn't think there would be too much of a change to yeah. which they asked uh <clears throat> with uh with the kind of changes we see happening with uh gay marriage and uh uh uh, like racial equality and uh, feminism and stuff. Why don't you think there could be that kind of change for goth culture? And I think that's kind of what you hit on is, is there's for that stuff, there's a not biological essentialism, but just a, there's a biological component. Mm -hmm. Whereas mainstream does end up viewing subcultures as just yeah. kind of a which, middle class, uh, like consumption yeah. aesthetic thing, which I find interesting because I mean, religion is not biological but we do kind of get mm. concerned when someone portrays you know particularly muslims yeah. in something right now because that's like a hot button thing obviously yeah. um so and that's chosen as well so for me it's kind of like are we just not going that extra step because the issues that we deal with are not are it's definitely discrimination but it's not institutionalized necessarily right um so i wonder if it's just not or if there's just not enough of us for people to be like too worried about it so like <laughs> yeah yeah well, but if you <laughs> yeah i mean it's I, I thought about that too but um i don't remember what the percentage of people that are trans are mm -hmm. in american population oh, it's extremely but it's small. really really low yeah yeah mm -hmm. um but we see that kind of stuff mm -hmm. you know playing out so yeah, yeah it's uh, it's interesting yeah we'll see where it goes i mean you know i kind of want to as a writer be very i do have three goth characters in my novel as well as um a couple of emo kids and i kind of thinking to myself like well i have like a lot of knowledge about not just goth but other subcultures yeah. as well because i i spent many years going through different scenes seeing what they were like listening to their music going to their shows and like talking to people and stuff and i was like well maybe i'll just do it you know <laughs> like why not somebody's yeah. got to say something about it or do something about it and so like in my among my friends who are writers like that i know from even 
in like professional settings like I, I do not hide at all the fact that I'm goth and they seem to really love it. <laughs> so I don't know if it's because I'm a horror writer and it works out for them and their exterior like view of it but you know it's just one of those things where um, you know writers are very respectful of different people too. Like you can't be a writer without being fascinated with people so I feel like that's part of it as well but like you know I was like well you know it may as well be me <laughs> like I don't know. I'm like you know, there's some stuff that she says later in the book about like goth clubs and vampire stuff. And I was like, this is really helpful. I didn't even think of it that way because there is a goth club in my novel. And I was like, I put a real goth club with real goths that are not vampires in a vampire novel. And I was like, wow, I didn't even think of, about the fact that that was like unusual. <laughs> and so reading this actually like helped me. I was like, that's like, that's different. I didn't realize how different that was until she pointed that out. And so it was Yeah, really, she talks about that later. Yeah, well, I'll I'll get excited about that later again, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just like I mean, it, it's one of those things where like it you know, I I think it, you know, someone could start that conversation. Maybe it'll yeah. maybe it'll be me. <laughs> Who knows. <laughs> but there's also another, I guess, subtext to yeah. that the very question that she's asking that's kind of positing goth as something being defined as in opposition to a mainstream culture. Yeah. This idea that, you know, kind of the gotcha questions you'll sometimes get, well, you know, if everybody in mainstream culture starts wearing black, are you going to have to start wearing blue or white or pink yeah. or whatever, because you have to be different. You have to be strange. And that's based purely on, I guess, an assumption that it's, yeah, that it's a purely nonconformist. Mm -hmm basis rather than no i just like black or i just like macabre music or mm -hmm. you know whatever other aspects of the uh the subculture that you like and if the mainstream all of a sudden started gravitating to that as long as it still fits within your aesthetic you're still gonna like it yeah exactly it's the only problem is when the uh when the you know the the culture is co-opted by the mainstream and then misinterpreted yeah and that's where the danger is when they're taking you know, like you were saying, the stereotypical goth character and just making them a sex pot. Yeah. Or, or a lot of all time, into the fetish stuff for vampires. Yeah. Or sometimes like what I, I, I'm sort of taking it upon myself to like read a, a lot of books with goth characters in them. And I sort of went through this. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's this. I take a, I take a look at those, like most of them and they look awful. Uh, yeah. So and it, it. it, yeah, I might have to skip through some of them, but what you see a lot is that the, you know, she mentions like the the happy goth girl in this, but like there's the other yep. one who's like kind of mean and dangerous, and she's kind of put in there um, to like take somebody out of their normal world. And it's not just like they're presenting you with this like happy place; they're taking you into like a dangerous place. And so that's another Higher craft. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Night of the demons. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's not that those that necessarily makes the character bad. Like, I actually think the character Nancy in the craft is actually a really well crafted character. The problem with her is that she's one of four bajillion mean goth girls, and like that's the it's so it's like the scarcity thing. You know, yeah. if there were more yeah. diverse, complete portrayals of yeah. goth, it wouldn't be as problematic. You know what I'm saying? Because like I really, yeah. yeah, that that movie I wrote about that as a paper I loved it it like I read it to like read it the script and watched it to um help me with my own book and it's just uh -oh. I love it a lot but um I think it's really so, well done but so yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on yeah. here we got a lot to get to uh so uh, I'm gonna skip around a little bit but she so she starts <laughs> I just want to point this out because I thought it was funny uh, maybe unfortunate I don't know but she starts to build her case for the happy gothic um, by referencing Voltaire's book on how to create a gothic living space, <laughs> uh, which a lot of people have, have read. I, that was my first goth book, actually. Um, but she claims that <clears throat> this uh, av averts the truly horrific by drawing on conventional taste to craft a charming and subdued environment. Um, and it's funny because he just did a web series uh, about how to, well, he's redecorating his apartment, but it's about how to create a, a gothic living space. And it's not this kind of um, <clears throat> subdued, uh, classy kind of gothic. It's very much the ostentatious, uh, horrific gothic tableau um he's got taxidermied animals like gaudy mor morbid furniture and all this stuff and uh so it's funny because it kind of subverts what <laughs> she's trying to get at here yeah. but 
I did, Mark, getting back to what you were mentioning earlier about the, the gothic and the goth distinction, I want to read this a little bit because I think it's really important and I wish it had been used through the rest of the book to, to uh, really more extensively. Uh, but uh, page 30, she says, if gothic or goth lifestyles signal the presence of a particular kind of taste culture, which relatively, with relatively consistent preferences and values, lifestyle gothic, on the other hand, is what happens when individuals who are not committed to goth subculture appropriate its imagery and aesthetics or the imagery and aesthetics of gothic fiction in the production, marketing, and consumption of mainstream material culture. Lifestyle gothic is transient. Its adherents might wear a gothic look for a single party or a single season and then move on to the latest fashion. It is piecemeal. Consumers might select a gothic living room, but a minimalist bathroom and a rustic country kitchen. It is linked to mainstream rather than subcultural patterns for consumption. <clears throat> uh, stuff featured in high street stores or popular television programs rather than cult ephemera or niche publications. However, it is important to recognize that it participates in similar cultural contexts and processes as, quote, authentic subcultural productions, or indeed as original Gothic texts. So what I, my, my thing here is she starts off by saying there's a difference between what she terms lifestyle Gothic, which I like, and kind of lays out what that is. But then at the very end, she says, hints at essentially one of my main problems with the book, that it's... the subcultural consumption and lifestyle gothic both share cultural contexts and processes um and that lifestyle gothic does similar things to what could be considered authentic subcultural production and i really wish that she had delineated through the book more strongly between gothic lifestyles and goth mm -hmm. subculturalist participation because she i think she kind of ends up conflating those two and trying to argue that um the lifestyle gothic or mainstream consumption of these this ephemera is akin to what we see in goth subculture and that really bothered me i don't like the name like lifestyle gothic <clears throat> referring to a, a mainstream consumption because it it it's really only temporary in the long run when you compare it to you know, long-term sure. subcultural participants. Yeah, it's kind of her. So, th I mean, because life's the word lifestyle gets used with different definitions, and for her, it's explicitly um, just how you what you kind of consume and what you uh, what you buy for how you dress and how you uh, what kind of records you put in your house and that kind of thing. So, even if it's only a lifestyle for a year or something, that's your lifestyle at the moment. But it does, it, it's kind of like, but that's the problem is it's conflating uh, something with, for a goth lifestyle would be something you would assume is your life. For life. For life, yeah, <laughs> with more ephemeral stuff. There's a, there's a word order distinction that matters here because she's using, when she says lifestyle gothic, she's using lifestyle in the same way a newspaper would use when they say a lifestyle section in that mm. it's dealing with topics relating to consumption, relating to, you know, your lifestyle being or the lifestyle section dealing with home decor, dealing with, right. you know, fashion topics, stuff like that. And that's what the lifestyle section is dealing with. And that's what she means by lifestyle. And that if she used the term gothic lifestyle, okay. um, that word order is more defining, you know, a choice that an individual is making for how they decide to live their life, how they decide to style their life. Um, so I think that's kind of the decision she's making and why she used the, what would, otherwise be a strange word order in lifestyle gothic. So that's fine. I mean, my, and this will come up throughout, but the word I'm going to use a lot is coterminous, which basically means two, two or more things that share the same boundaries. And it seems like she positions, argues through the book that uh, both goth, goths and lifestyle gothic, if you want to use that mainstream consumption, um, are coterminous they end up being the same thing mm -hmm. um and we'll get into the kind of specific details of that i guess but it i wish she had just made that distinction a bit more <clears throat> uh so let's see she continues to describe goth as a commodity culture uh which we'll get into here um 
in which identity is dependent on consumption and supported by niche subcultural vendors whom themselves are part of the culture. And she touches on the Gothic as being a revivalist movement with no authentic origin, uh, which is the ghost of the counterfeit. Uh, she goes on to say, quote, if contemporary consumer practices continue this process of ghosting the counterfeit, in doing so they cannot dilute the Gothic as the Gothic is already a pale imitation of itself. Uh, so she starts setting up both of those as uh, consumerist uh, commodities. Um, so the, the next section, she, she analyzes uh, some TV advertisements uh, and how they portray goths, saying that they appear to be laughing with rather than at goths, uh, to which, again, my methodological quip comes up that I don't feel main, the mainstream perspective or relationship with goths themselves have much to say about how we read goth identities. Um, and I think she, again, places too much emphasis on their influence. Uh, so here's where we get into this uh, <clears throat> gothic lifestyle thing. She, she talks about, she brings up the goth cruise documentary. I don't know if you guys have seen I know, Mark, you watched it at my house. Yeah, I've been on it. Uh, the documentary, though, specifically. No, not, not, I wasn't on the actual documentary right. cruise, but I have been on a goth cruise. Yeah. Uh, so she brings up that documentary and talks about how it portrays goths as having a full range of emotion, uh, which includes happiness, <laughs> oh my and argues that um, goths, because they exist alongside the mainstream without fully eschewing it, um, by having children, buying minivans, having mortgage payments, etc., um, that they have a, a really close relationship with that. She goes on to quote other academics that agree goth in part is a culture of consumption and because the gothic is inextricably linked to a western culture of consumption uh, she says that by the end of the 20th century the notion of a gothic lifestyle had become irrevocably blurred with the notion of a goth lifestyle that's a quote i think this has more to do with us being around long enough to do those things like people are now like aging in the subculture and i don't know i just find it funny the whole like goths having goths having a full range of emotions like okay we're people <laughs> i yeah. don't know it just kind of found yeah and like with the end of the 20th century like that's when like people who have been who were in the scene at the beginning would start needing mortgages and having children and <laughs> it just seems like kind of like it's not it was more of a practical development than it was like, mm. I don't know, us conforming or something. I just it's like what what were they expecting us to exactly, do? Exactly, yeah. I was like, does not grow up ever. Just like sit in dungeons forever. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, I think the argument there is that it's is she's saying that goths participate in Western consumerism. Yeah, and I mean even even except for maybe the crustiest of punks. Uh, even like punk culture has to a large yes. degree, you know, grown. Yeah. if you want to eat your, eat food <laughs> and <laughs> sleep, not in the rain. I mean, what, you kind of don't have an option. There. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. With possibly the exception of those people who are just big into that sort of self-sufficiency subculture that start yeah. their own communes and, you know, make their own power, make all their own food and completely cut themselves off from society for whatever reason every subculture is going to be participating in a mainstream consumerist culture just because that's the world we live in and we have you know biological needs that need to be <laughs> met and you know we're not averse to consuming things that the mainstream produces we're not just locked into our own little subcultural box refusing to engage with the rest of the world um i don't so... know about minivans you know <laughs> i just yeah. yeah, that I don't crosses know. the line I for me. So. Yeah. yeah, something just I don't came know. to if mind. You put some bat wings on it and make it black. <laughs> it's, it's fine. Yeah. So I was just thinking. Nope. Um, there was a, a I forget which person it was, but there was a video from an elder goth who was talking about what it, the earlier days were like, and she said, "Well, a lot of the stuff that we liked was popular, and we didn't really have a problem with that." So I kind of feel like, you know, you know, it makes sense that you know, I think we would maybe adjust a little bit <laughs> more than some of the other cultures have. And like you said, you know, even punks have adjusted 
you know um yeah you know it may just you know but i think the difference with us is that we were kind of like not oppositional from the beginning maybe subversive but not oppositional if that makes so, sense so yeah. here's what she has to say about that because I'm I'm gonna she brings that up at the end. She says neither gothic nor goth lifestyle can be wholly oppositional in the 21st century. 21st century, they are subordinated to a broader culture of consumer choice in which they begin. <clears throat> excuse me, in which they become one more option in the process of styling the self. Mm -hmm. That does not, however, render them meaningless. As these examples have shown, Gothic continues to produce moments of difficulty or discomfort exactly. within the seamless manufacture of lifestyle, complicating easy judgments in the production and transmission of taste. As the participants on the Goth cruise indicate, moreover, Goth as lifestyle does retain moments of oppositional force in specific mm -hmm. and localized context. This is not exclusive of its embrace of leisure and pleasure, but closely bound up with them. The Corp Goth's weekend corset is her refusal to allow the corporate world to define her, even as it is financed by her corporate wages. Um, which I thought I had a quote about uh, something else here, but I don't. But it, she kind of, before we jump out of this chapter, she does bring up somewhere that Goth is a, a middle class lifestyle because of these, uh, because of the stuff we, we kind of talked about. Um, that that you can interpret goth ideals and, and norms um in the 21st century through a middle class lens and i'm not sure i totally buy that argument um especially if you're just saying because it's uh, partially consumerist um mm. do you guys have have opinions on that i mean my thing is that you have sure you do have lots of middle class goths but you have plenty i know i think probably most of the goths in chicago are are pretty lower class uh, as far as far as terms of of income are concerned um there's some that are upper middle class or or high i think i think there's a whole spectrum there and as far as lifestyles are concerned there are people who do uh what is it that william faith does the uh something with a p with the plants oh uh does he, he does permaculture uh, permaculture yeah, yeah stuff like that where it's um it's about being more trying to be self-sufficient rather than participating in, in the, the, the system. I don't, I just don't know if I buy the, the goth is a middle-class culture thing. Yeah, I don't me either. either. No. Well, I guess for me, the thing would be that there's a lot of aspects of goth, of goth subcultural capital that requires some manner of liquid asset frequently in that you get capital by attending certain concerts by certain bands and that costs money. You, you get mm. capital by going to club nights that costs money. You get sure, subcultural but... capital by what you're wearing and that costs money though. There is the thrifting and all that. Yeah. So you can make, you can minimize that. But a lot of the C and B scene aspect of the goth subculture is not accessible to people who are actually poor without well, a lot of sacrifices outside in other yes. aspects of their life. But I that and that's it because I know a, at least several people who they're only like they literally only spend money on food and like a small apartment and then shows and it's it's like that's their o the only thing that they spend non essential income on is goth related events mm -hmm. so they still are are poor they don't have any money but they just dedicate it all to that so I I don't. I don't know if you can, I don't think you can use that as an argument for goth. I, I guess the question is, can you define the poor as someone who mm -hmm. has any non-essential money? Uh, yeah, I guess low income is what I meant. Low income, yeah. Yeah, because a lot of our... I, I, I looked it up once. I don't remember what the line is. Yeah. But... Uh, I mean, and the other thing is like a lot of, at least here in, you know, the in, well, in DC and here, um, you know, a lot of the shows and events are not as expensive to get into as they are for other things you know like i um i'm always like kind of keeping an eye on like how much it costs to get into like a big stadium show versus like one of our little bar club shows and so it it is a i would actually say that in that sense it's a little bit more accessible because like you or even like the cover to get in some of our like our club nights versus other ones it's like the more mainstream ones can sometimes cost three or four times as much to get in like whereas our, our place might be five or ten dollars theirs is like 18 or 20 you know what i'm saying so i just kind of like 
in a sense, I almost think it's more accessible. And I wonder if that, like, I've always kind of applied that to God's like kind of punk roots, you know, because when I was growing up going to punk shows, they purposely made them all incredibly cheap to yeah. get into um, at the, probably at their own financial expense, um, just to make it accessible yep. to not just younger people, but, you know, people living the punk lifestyle are probably not, are going to be more on the low income end usually. Yeah. So... I don't know, I almost felt like it was about accessibility, but also like, I guess also artistic purity to try and not make it about making money. <laughs> so, anyway. right, right. It could also be about just personal taste. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I personally prefer the small bar shows. Mm -hmm. I love the intimacy and just, you know, how uh, organic it feels mm -hmm. compared to the massive stadium shows. That's yeah. just personal yeah, taste. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. Like, even if, like, I think they had My. Depeche Mode just went through recently, and I was like, even if I could afford to go to that show, I'm not sure if I would yeah. because it was at the football stadium. And I was like, that's entirely too many people for me to deal with. And, like, they're yeah. going to be, like, tiny little, they're going to be, like, little figurines mm -hmm. in the distance. It's not going to be any fun. Yeah, I got, <laughs> I got both ends of that spectrum yeah. last weekend. Mm -hmm. I saw Drab Majesty in a little bar mm -hmm. and a couple days later Depeche Mode <laughs> in a yeah. amphitheater. Yeah. I guess I would contrast it a little bit more with something like the hippie culture where a lot of events would be, hey, let's all go into a drum jam in the park <laughs> yeah. and you can bang on any bucket yeah. you can find or, you know, hey, let's go work in a little garden and, you know, work in a community garden. And these are no cost stuff it's much more approachable for people who are actually poor and or homeless they don't need some of those mm -hmm. they don't necessarily get subcultural capital through things that are consumer risk based or you know require a money expenditure and you're right the gothic or most goth events they're on the cheaper end mm -hmm. of the spectrum yeah. but they're still not free exactly there's still mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there there's is... still an expense and that expense is beyond you know, a, a minimal hand to mouth kind of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there is some of that though. I mean, that like f me and a few people I know specifically in Chicago will try to have house parties more often because they can't afford to go out. Like I just went to someone's party in Chicago and they have like basically no furniture. <laughs> they have like a bed and, uh, but they were having people over. Someone brought a record player. Someone made a cake someone uh, uh brought some records and it was just kind of it was still a goth get together thing um and like i'll do kind of board game nights which you could argue are are more middle class because you have to be able to afford games <laughs> but just you know get together stuff it does happen it's not i i think you're right trey but there's there is still some of that other end of the spectrum yeah too. i think what this all kind of suggests is that you can kind of adapt it pretty easily to whatever your income level is, you could have the house parties or you could go to the show or you could, you know, interact. Like I know some yeah. people use the, you know, there's the, the internet community as well, which I kind of go in and out of, but yeah. you know, there's also that as well. Um, yeah. Don't get, let's not get let's started. Let's not get started. No, community. let's not go there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the quality of that. No. <laughs> so uh, just briefly on chapter two, this is where, she basically argues that today's gothic is defined by Burton, Tim Burton specifically, rather than uh, Tim Burton being defined by gothic. Um, and then she goes on to argue that in his films, he places the substantive emphasis squarely in the visual medium. Mm -hmm. And that because of Burton's near redefining of what the gothic means today and the goth subculture's affinity for his works, we can then understand a fundamental shift in goth subculture uh, to more of a visual medium through Burton's interpretations. And I think that's the basic premise. So if I'm right or wrong, or if you guys have any thoughts about if she's reaching too far, or if you think she's pretty accurate in that. I can't speak to it from the gothic standpoint. I don't know necessarily how it's affected the gothic as far as literary ideas or cinematic ideas and, and all that. But as far as the goth subculture, I really didn't see much of a change in the gothic sub or the goth subculture from pre to post Burton, other than, you know, Burton has a lot of fun imagery that, that can be used and it certainly fits in. And so it's been added. It's certainly a part of the subculture, but I wouldn't say it changed any sort of 
definition of underlying basis. And as far as, you know, the, the, I just totally lost track of where I was going. Um, as mm -hmm. far as interpretations of Burton and stuff like that and how he's brought into the subculture, um, I don't think it's either way. It's just, he's an, he's an element of his time and he came out and he did his thing and his thing is certainly been embraced by members of the goth subculture, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't think I, it informs it. Yeah. I do think she is right. Um, a, that, uh, you, you can't really understand the, the influence Burton has had on modern day Gothic, uh, film and, and books can't be overstated enough, especially film. I do think she's right in that. Uh, there's some other books that have been written about that specifically, but yeah, when it comes to, <clears throat> and I think through this chapter, what she's trying to do is, is say that because of that relationship between Burton's works and uh, Goth's affinity for it, you can then view a shift, a modern day shift in Goth subculture to being more visual, visual based, which is something some people have tried to argue online, not specifically because of Burton, but because of, um, they don't like goth music or they don't uh it's not a lifestyle for them or whatever um but i think this is a misstep and she kind of builds on it in chapter three and i just don't think you can do that kind of backwards interpretation goth as a revivalist movement is about interpreting and appropriating those ephemera into what is already existing rather than being uh, interpreted by mainstream changes yeah, and I'd say the the visual aspect of it is is more just what is seen from the outside, as rather than the internal, you know, within the goth subculture. And I think more of that is influenced not by Burton, but by the rise of the internet as a communications medium, which yeah. has really evolved to be a very much a visual medium. It's a lot about sharing pictures and videos. And while there is a textual basis underlying the internet that's you know definitely been downplayed in modern internet usage hence why tldr and things like that actually exist it's been a much more visual thing and the b and since that is a major component of modern society's communication and interactions with one another it's no surprise that from the outside at least goth subculture seems to have transitioned to a much more visual subculture and the fact that burton's movies came out at the same time as the rise of internet culture mm. means you're conflating, I think, two different things together yeah. into one it's thing. It's coincidence. Right. Yeah. So uh, moving into chapter three, then she begins building on the emphasis of the visual over everything else uh, by talking about new grave and an increased reliance on spectacular style as a defining factor of goth. Uh, and she spends some time exploring <clears throat> high fashion inter and runway interpretations of goth and their rejection of uh, normal natural beauty in favor of alternative visions of horrific excessive artificial and sometimes sexually fetishistic beauty which i'm on board with generally however then she asks uh, and this is a quote and I, I would like to get your guys thoughts on this uh quote could a piece of clothing bought in h and m or gap be transgressive and resistant to normative standards of beauty? What might it tell us about the state of the 21st century Gothic that the middle-class quintessentially English department store uh, named one of their collections Gothic chic? I would say absolutely. Anything bought anywhere can be used, you know, as a, as a uh, transgression or a resistance to, you know, mainstream cultural ideas, mainstream aesthetics, because it's not really the clothes itself. It's not the individual items of clothing that make it conformist or transgressive. It's how you wear them. It's in what context you wear them. It's in what combinations you wear them. So you can easily make anything transgressive. But the bigger point is, why does it need to be transgressive? We already kind of touched on that earlier, that, that goth subculture isn't in its you know, Genesis, a inherently transgressive, it's not there to transgress things, it's there to do its own thing. That own thing happens to transgress modern sensibilities in some aspects. Mm -hmm. And that's shifted 
with time. It's also shifted with culture too. It's more transgressive in certain cultures than others, um, just because of the underlying cultural meanings of various things. But there's nothing keeping a, an item from H and M from being transgressive, and that's above and beyond even before you've DIY'd it. Because I mean, you can DIY anything to make it as transgressive as you like. Get a nice yeah. pink little shirt and cut out breast holes and leave your breasts hanging out, and it's transgressive. Though you got it at H and M. Yeah, yeah. I think again, this is the she's doing. She's looking at the discursive nature of the two backwards. Uh, so yeah. So she she builds on this here. This is a, a quote I want to read. Um, she says, "Goth's longevity as a subculture." <clears throat> Anthropologist Ted Polemis has argued, derives from its inherent opposition to mainstream consumer ideology. Quote, to a majority that fetishizes, fetishizes happiness, goth is by its very nature off-putting. Unquote. So, uh, with that setup, she goes on to say, in quoting uh, or citing Paul Hodkinson's ethnographic research, um, that uh, what he found is is goths resist the notion that gothic style can be read as an index of the wearer's personality, outlook, or behavior, furthering this kind of uh, parallel between mainstream consumption of gothic ephemera and goth subcultures' use of that. And I thought that was interesting because he so he 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 put out these surveys at uh, Whippy Goth Weekend. And basically what the, what people were saying is, or what goths were saying is that their style was just their style and it didn't actually say anything about who they were as individuals or anything about their personality or their, their outlook on life or that kind of thing. And God, that that's, seems really wow. atypical to me. Yeah. If I had to hazard a guess as to what might account for that response is simply the fact that there is a not insignificant misunderstanding of of what those signifiers are. So it's not that the appearance isn't signifying something. It's that they're saying what you think this signifies is wrong, and that's why you can't judge how I am based on what I'm looking at. But if somebody understood what this signified, they would be able to read me a little bit better. It's more of like a defensive yeah. thing. I would think so, yeah. That makes sense. I mean, personally, I'm of the opinion that the way we present ourselves is, to a degree, a mirror into our inner lives. Yeah. But it's not something that's necessarily written in the language that everybody can exactly. understand. Mm. Yeah, I was about to say that it might signify this to you, but it actually signifies... Yeah, like with us, it, a big part of it is that, like, you know, what what we do is not... You know, I was just flipping through somewhere leather, somewhere lace earlier today, and I was reading about how, like, mm -hmm. you know, goth sort of, like, subverted um, or sort of, like, went against what was, and still does, but particularly back then, went against the idea, against the idea of what is beautiful. So I think a lot of people look at goths and think, oh, they're trying to be ugly, but we're actually just being our version of pretty or, you know, or our version of happy, even, which seems to be kind of like, which might kind of go with what this book is saying about like you know what you hear over and over again goth saying is that we're not like miserable people but we kind of like for some reason things that signify like sadness make us happy for some reason so it's like <laughs> you know that one <laughs> well right and that's that's why you have to mm -hmm. interpret the semiotic mm -hmm. expressions of the culture through exactly. their lens rather than looking at how the mainstream like runway yeah. is using it. Yeah, and that's kind of like what I was saying earlier about how she's looking at like the finished product and not like what led up to it, if that makes any sense. Um, but, like what it looks like from the outside without having any background um, as to how, you know, how we came to that, that artistic conclusion, you know, whether you're talking about someone who created like a a gothic novel that became popular or even us as a culture creating all of these aesthetics and uh music and fashion and such and you know not really asking us where that came from you know what I'm... <laughs> mm -hmm. right right so uh she here she jumps into the uh talking about the columbine massacre which i before the book came out i thought would be the main drive of uh 
her her talking points here, but she starts to talk about <clears throat> the uh, coverage in the media uh, of the atrocity as being committed by goths uh, and how this was the, she claims this was the break for goths into the mainstream. Uh, she quotes someone who published a statement uh, a day after the shooting that compared goth to the Burtonesque, again, to reinforce the notion that uh, today, goth is more visually based and more whimsical and quirky rather than a source of horror. And she tries to kind of talk about how uh, this was a turning point for goth to uh, change its image, sort of. Uh, but my, my, my question and my problem here is that... Um, so, like, Nancy Kilpatrick, who wrote uh, the goth Bible, um, says it's goth is about fun. And I think I would argue that goth has always been like that. It's always exactly, had an element yeah. of the whimsical macabre. Yeah. I, like, for example, uh, the Batcave, I think, is a good example. The Batcave was really embraced the, the kind of monster camp and the sarcastic self-deprecating <laughs> humor and the silliness and all that kind of stuff. And I think that's always been around. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe... I don't, I don't, you guys can weigh in on this. I don't know. Maybe pre Columbine massacre in the in the early '90s, goth had moved from being sillier to being more morbid and and angry or something. And that's the Mansonites, maybe. But and like any, I, if you want to even call them, goths. yeah. And I I feel right. like some of the other like alternative movements during that time might have had an effect as well, like the grunge movement and all that. Because like you know, things kind of react to each other. Um, so if you have this kind of whimsical era, you might have this more serious one happen again. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I would have been far too young to <laughs> know anything about it then. But, yeah, so... It... Yeah, I'd say there's, there's been a whole sort of evolutionary chronology across all of Western cultures that kind of bounce between happy, jokey, whimsical, and overly serious, but with goth's inception, and, you know, it's debatable what the first goth music was, but some people do pen it, peg it on, you know, Bella Lugosi's Dead, which is itself a joke song. I mean, it was making fun of taking vampires too seriously, and Bella Lugosi's Dead, Undead, Undead, that's a joke. It's meant to be a joke, but it's played very serious, and that's where part of the humor is. Yes. But that yeah. humor isn't necessarily something that easily translates to people outside. So it seems like a very serious piece. But then, as you mentioned, you've got the Batcave scene, you've got Alien Sex Fiend, you've got yeah. the Virgin Bananas. Prunes. And a lot of these things are just mm. jokes and fun times, and it's taking the, the darker aspects and just making light of it. But I think chronologically speaking, it sort of started in that. And that was kind of the 80s thing, too. The 80s had a very sort of whimsical, fun, bouncy aspect to it. But then when the 80s continued into the mid 80s and went into the 90s, Western culture in general just got darker. Hence the rise of grunge movement. And the goth culture kind of shadowed that. A lot of the bands that were coming out later became a little bit or at least seemed to be a little bit more self-consciously serious they didn't want to evoke the jokey yeah. stuff. They wanted to be taken more seriously. And so there might have been a little bit of that going through that era. And then, you know, maybe something happened relating to Columbine, but I don't think that had anything really to do with it. But there was a, yeah. a kickback against that. Goth started seeing their culture becoming too serious. And when something becomes too serious, the natural response is to take the piss out of it exactly yeah. so it starts yeah. getting funny again and then you know people like voltaire mm -hmm. come out and start making fun of the overly self-serious nature of goth but you know my experience being in the gothic subculture since the mid 90s um is that it was always it always had this sort of sardonic wit about it it always had this self-referential self-deprecating side where oh yes we're all so sad and morose and had hand staple forehead and we were overplaying that for humor and for fun but again it's something that from the outside if you don't know you know the language if you don't know the stereotypes it can look like you know our over dramaticism is actually us being dramatic and not making fun of our own stereotypical right. dramaticism yeah, I think maybe what 
would be more accurate if she kind of argued that is that um but of course like she didn't look like that maybe a more accurate statement would be that mainstream perception of us started to shift you know we were always a certain way and then right. maybe our reactions where we had to speak out like, with columbine and all that right it started to become apparent to people that oh they're you know, fully formed people who have like, you know, other, you know, they're being kind of silly about this and maybe have, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's good. I think, yeah, because a lot of the, you know, she might argue that a lot of the representation of goth on the news and stuff like that, you had goths trying to argue that, hey, we're just mm -hmm. people and we're the same as everyone else uh, as a shift in the subculture. But really that I would say that's probably something that was there mm -hmm. all along and we were just presenting that side out of <laughs> maybe fear yeah. of, of exactly. reciprocity. Yeah, and I mean, whatever. I know here, I, like here in Colorado, like, um, you know, I was, I met, uh, my boyfriend was raised in the Aurora, Denver area. And he says that he still, to this day, if he's wearing a trench coat, someone will, some people will ask him if he's carrying a shotgun oh. underneath it. So like, it's still like lingering here, but I guess that kind of makes sense because Littleton yeah. is super close to here. And plus there was the Aurora shooting a while ago as well. Yeah. But yeah, like, so there's still a little bit of that going on, but I don't think we're, you know, cause like what I was kind of thinking of next is like, are we still on this defensive here? And I guess like it maybe kind of depends yeah. on where you live. Um, yeah. You know, so I don't know. <laughs> Usually in the smaller towns, they're a little more defensive. Yeah, yeah I can see that. I live in I, yeah. I'd say we're yeah. definitely we're definitely still on the defensive when the spotlight mm -hmm. comes on us, when people are asking questions. We tend to try to put our best foot forward because we know these lingering stereotypes mm -hmm. exist. We know that we're still assumed to be dangerous people yeah. simply because people still remember those events. And I'd say any sort of shift in perception has simply been due to you know, internal members of the subculture attempting damage control when our subculture went from being just kind of in the background, nobody paid a lot of attention to it. It was just those weird kids that do the things and I don't really care. And all of a sudden, mainstream culture saw us as a huge threat. And so in order to survive, in order to not be basically eradicated through legalistic mm -hmm. means or through just violence against the threat, we had to be doing damage control and show that you know we're not here to hurt you we're not here to do dangerous things our drive is not to kill people mm -hmm. or sacrifice people or to damage society we're just living our life over here and we're trying to show you that you know our lives are full of banal normal <laughs> things too it's not all everybody you poops. know doing stuff exactly it's very trench exactly it's raining. <laughs> or snowing most likely it's snowing here but but yeah, I thought that was really sad when he said that. I was like, really? You know? Yeah. 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 Uh, so she, she closes out the chapter by talking about uh, uh, Sophie Lancaster, uh, and she brings up the idea of politicization um, by talking about how that event was used in the media to uh, promote ideological agendas from both the conservative and uh, liberal parties. Um, and she, she then s says that, uh, the two, those two incidents together and the reactions by goth for Sophie specifically about trying to legis legislate hate crimes, um, undermines the idea that an essential element of the culture is resistance. Uh, she basically says that resistance was the, uh, main drive of goth. And that subcultures thrive on um, the concept of resistance, uh, which was a quote, I think, from, from later in the chapter. Um, and that the, the drive to legislate hate crimes and to change the narrative in the media uh, by removing the negative or violent narrative around the subculture um, identifies a shift uh, in, in the, the ethos of, of goth. and. I don't <clears throat> necessarily want to get into a discussion about whether goth is political or not, but uh, we, if we could briefly kind of touch on, touch on if this idea of promoting acceptance of cultural diversity uh, to minimize otherness is inherently political or belies the... Because we get into the assimilative vampire 
And she says that this kind of stuff belies the desire for goths to become more accepted and to assimilate into mainstream culture. I don't, I really don't think saying, please don't kill me is the same as asking, please understand everything about my culture and embrace me and love me. Cause like being, I don't know, being, yeah. you know, sympathized with as a human is not necessarily saying like, you can say, Oh, this person, I don't fully understand why this person is the way they are but I understand that they're human and they don't deserve to die just because they're different or like be treated differently because other people think that they're going to hurt them. You know, I just, I feel like that's, I don't know. There's something kind of ridiculous about that to me. So I just, yeah, I, I mean, cause the other thing is like, you don't have to understand everything about a person who's different than you to like recognize that they're a human. Right. So I don't, yes. I don't understand why like we have to be, okay with like sort of implicitly okay with getting killed to be subversive or what have you it's just yeah. respect goths just want respect yeah. they always and, have yeah and you don't you don't have to to even like someone to respect them like you don't have to like our culture to respect that it is a culture and that it makes people happy you don't even you don't need to like it you don't need to understand it to do that Okay, so let's let's move on. Uh, she's gonna she's gonna lead into the next chapter here, which is gonna be interesting. Uh, but she ends <clears throat> by trying to bring these two together, uh, reiterating that celebratory and romantic goth aesthetics and narratives uh, became attractive to the mainstream and to mainstream consumers, and this is embodied by the assimilative vampire who wants to become as mainstream as possible, and as she puts it quote, has clear resonances with the construction of subculture as equivalent to other persecuted minorities and the campaign for their assimilation. Mm. I, that's kind of a little, I mean, we are, like, vampires are often seen as a metaphor for the outsider. I tend not to take the view that a character is a metaphor, they're an imaginary person. Um, so I feel like you know, when you're going to, for the assimilated vampire, it was just, yeah. Uh, wait, hang on. Are you telling me vampires are not real? Because I'm, I'm going to be really no. upset. How dare yeah, you? Yeah. Um, well, well ima or imaginary people. Well, if you're talking about characters, like, I'm not saying they can't be real. You can still, yeah. But, okay. But okay. them being as, as metaphors for outsiders, I feel like you would take the experience of outsiders to render someone like that because that's real like realistically how they would exist if they if they do maybe they do maybe they don't um so um i feel like that just was like to make the assimilated elated vampire was like the next step past the sympathetic vampire which we got in the 70s with right. Anne rice and others um so it makes sense that at, at some point along the line someone says well what if they what if they really want to be part of us what if they want to be nice to us and it, if you think about it like you know, having this, these diverse types of vampires it almost reflects like different personalities. Like some of them, some of them would want to try to be nice to us. Some of them not so much, you know? And so it, it just kind of makes sense to me. I'm not sure if it really has anything to do with subculture. Um, you know, I know that, you know, cause that would imply to me that like the authors who create these characters would have to be paying attention to what's going on in subculture and like actively do that. And I think they're just, most of the time they're just trying to build a different type of character. Cause like when you go in to right. like a really loaded genre or character type or what have you, you want to stick out. And so you want to pick something that as far as you can see has not been done yet. And so it, you know, I think possibly some of the the more sympathetic view of of goth and maybe subculture in, in general like being more accepted maybe primed people to like understand stuff like this a little bit more possibly so that it would make more sense to them um but i don't know maybe it's also just our increasingly complex understanding of ourselves and people who are different than us and it, it just seems to me like it, it wouldn't have to do as much with, you know, wanting to create a reflection of that. Um, you could interpret it as that, but I'm not really sure if that's why all these different writers are doing that. Yeah. Before we discuss uh, chapter four and what 
she has to say about the relationship between vampires and goths. Uh, I would like to take a quick moment here to thank our Patreon members. If you have been on Patreon, you'll know that in the last uh, month, I've done a few live streams, um, one of which we had several guests on. Uh, and that was a lot of fun to get to hang out with some Patreon members and, and just kind of talk about life and general stuff like that. Uh, but if you would like to get those kind of perks and um, get some exclusive content uh, that's more targeted, more specifically about uh, news around goth and some contemporary stuff going on online, uh, you can head over to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions, where you can sign up for as little as $1 a month, and you'll get all that content and some extra content uh, if you pledge at higher levels. But of course, uh, the only reason we exist and continue to make shows at the moment is because of our Patreon members and uh, their direction and their input as to what they would like to see on the show. So if you want to have an impact, head over to patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. So first of all, at our <clears throat> founders level, we have Luna, Esmeralda, and Abigail. Thank you so much for continuing to support the show it is really really appreciated at the nocturnal council level we have kyra dolly natalie michelle ariel michelle uh skull girdle trey isabel nephilim and corruptus angela necromancy radio anthony and k and a new member for the nocturnal council azzy thank you so much for joining up with us this month and then at the crow's call level we have uh a new member fifth dream who hung out on the uh, uh live stream so thank you for joining and we also have our all the other cool people that support us and that would be paula robin uh who has a great uh photography business if you would like to check that out i've got them linked on the website Angela Benedict, Sarah, Esther, Jillian Venters, Emma, On the 13th, Kelly, Dom, Noir, Marco, David, longtime supporter, Brenda, Jessica, Christian, Alex Kennedy, Shelly, Rose, Eternal Winter, Angel, Quinn, Anne, Laurel, Jen, Elizabeth, and Lyrilith. If you'd like to get your name read on the show or get some of that bonus content, Get a chance to hang out with us uh, and have some input into the show and uh, check out the back catalog of videos and audio content. You can do that at Cemetery Confessions at patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. Right. So here's so so we'll just get into it then because this is I, I took chapter four. I might read one or two quotes, but I took chapter four and made a, a syllogism to show what she to try and explain what she's talking about here. And I think this is a pretty fair uh, synopsis. So there's there's two premises and a conclusion for this chapter. The first premise is that uh, in the post millennial era, vampires have sought to become the institution rather than the subversion to become as human or amiable towards humans as possible rather than be the other. Premise two is that goths and vampires have shared a historically propinquitous relationship, often informing or appropriating one another. And the conclusion is that as vampires have grown more polite and reinforced the happy gothic, so too have goths sought to remake their image in a similar fashion. Yeah, I feel like this is all, like the whole, the part, the relationship to goth is possibly coincidental. My other issue is that the assimilated vampire sure, yeah. was very trendy for a while and just paying attention to the industry, like the industry, the, as far as I'm going to speak from the like literature perspective, the literary, the, the literary industry was burned out on vampires for a really long time. And there were a lot of agents and editors saying no vampires, no vampires, no vampires. And now I'm starting to hear little like inklings of people wanting them again, but they're specifically saying no sparkly vampires and she says like the sparkly vampire is like the kind of almost embodiment of her or like representative of the assimilated vampire so 
I don't know, it, there's kind of a risk when you write about a trend while it's happening, um, because it's gonna, right, it's possibly yeah. bottoming it out, right, as you're saying it. Um, and it's kind of funny, because <laughs> I've got a book like right next to me that is very much not sparkly vampire, it is straight out horror. And I'm like, really excited about it for that reason. And so I am starting to see some more of those. Um, so I think the, you know, the other issue is that people will, no matter how much they love something, they will tire of it, not, and they'll kind of move on to something else. Like with Twilight and all YA audiences moved on to dystopian like five years ago, like they're, they're not reading this stuff anymore. They're reading dystopian and those are getting made into films right. now. I find it interesting that they're leading the way in this, but I don't, <laughs> that's a whole separate topic, but, um, you know, with it's, I, I don't know, it might have been a little overstated, but that's kind of the risk, like I said, when you write about a trend while it's happening. And so like now, I feel like we are possibly seeing the monstrous, horrific vampire come back because I think looking at kind of what people want to see in terms of dark, like I said, there's the dystopian, which we're sorry, you know, we have the Handmaid's Tale adaptation came out this year. And now all of a sudden we're seeing horror movies breaking records and stuff like that. So I wonder if we went from this like lighthearted dark to like a little more realistic dark, but not too brutal. And now we're like watching Get Out and It and stuff like that. And now we've got this, you know, this novel that I'm reading right now. And I'm thinking, are we are we shifting back to like dark, dark for a little while? So, and I mean, these industries, like even in the publishing industry, they move at such a breakneck speed that like, it's almost hard to tell, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, um, but she's like, I think one of the things with like the English literature is they, the, they don't necessarily pay attention to the industry. They pay attention to just the products that are coming out of it. And they don't look at like sales and like how popular is this and what's going on and what are agents and editors asking for like that's kind of the perspective that i was told to look at it all from like what what are agents and editors looking for what's hmm. booming you know and people saying you know don't write for the trend that's happening now write for the one that's happening next you know i'm not necessarily doing that but um i'm kind of yeah i'm gonna make a prediction yeah. it's uh erotic horse <laughs> porn oh my we can all oh, hope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, sorry. Did you want to say anything else or? Um, she, she kind of, she, she, well, I'll, I don't, I don't know if you had any other comments. I was going to talk about how she kind of tries to back this up by talking about Julian Venter's book. Uh, when did that book come out? Um, oh, that's a good question. My copy is downstairs, so I couldn't tell you. Uh, <clears throat> but basically she, she tries to reinforce this idea of goths seeking to be more assimilated or, or amiable to the mainstream by referencing uh, Julian Venter's book. Uh, what was it called? Gothic Charm yeah. School. Gothic, Gothic Charm, Charm School. School. Yeah. Uh, Published in 2009. Which, 2009. Okay. And sh so that she says it yeah. focuses on a range. Um, it focuses on being polite uh, as being subversive, the most subversive thing you can do as a goth. Uh, and because it messes with preconceptions more effectively than uh, being surly. And she talks about how this also comes with a range of benefits like workplace tolerance um, or being able to find goth clothing in the bargain bins. Um, and that the the shift here is to for goths to implement correct or appropriate behavior for what's you know specific social circumstances that are expected in in kind of the mainstream uh, that would only social place marketplace i don't know because like that's her it's for her it's almost like a self-help <clears throat> book so that's what she's telling us to do but that's not necessarily what we're all doing um it's so, like i you know this i know that this book i i've not read it i've read bits of it and I've read her website from time to time and I know some people really disagree with her idea that because we're goth we have to be like extra nice to make people not think that our culture is made up of meanies and so I I think she does kind of acknowledge that but I don't know I'm not sure 
if you can really connect the two because like i said i think vampire writers are doing their thing for one reason and goths are doing our we're doing our thing for another reason um and i don't i don't think we've changed as much as our the view of us has changed and so i think that i'm not really sure if that helps if calling on that book really helps make that point yeah she tries to say that uh the this it, it it's part of the shift in how goths can potentially be subversive because it's she's she's saying that gothic charm school shows that the old uh, punk resistance model uh doesn't work in a world of globalized media and that even though the uh the book appears to be more socially conservative uh and and like affirming of of values and and mores that the mainstream culture uses it's uh it's it's subversive because it uh subverts the mainstream expectations of goths because they expect yeah. us to be the more aggressive punk yeah, that kind makes of thing more sense. and that's but in in that in of itself though still lends itself to to goths wanting to be more assimilated by the mainstream and i, I don't I think that we are don't... <laughs> you know and yeah. i'm not even sure yeah, i think there's either. not anymore at least <clears throat> not according to this book that i'm reading <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i think there's a general conflation here between wanting to be assimilated and wanting to simply be accepted mm -hmm. you know as we've mentioned right. multiple times you know, if you maintain the other status to such a high degree that you're in imminent danger of attack from, you know, members of the mainstream society and you're not going to be protected by, you know, the the protective structures around our culture, be it police or the legal system or whatever, then, you know, as a response to that, because we don't want to die, we need to do what we can to make ourselves seem less threatening or to legislate away the, you know, the dangers like with the, the hate crimes legislation in the UK. Um, and that, but that's not us wanting to assimilate. We're not trying to be mainstream. We're not trying to hide what we're doing. In fact, the fact that we're acting out in that way is saying we don't want to be assimilated because if we wanted to be assimilated, we just not be goth. We would simply dress normal and, and assimilate. But we're not doing that. We're continue. We want to continue being who we are, but we want to be acknowledged by the rest of society that we can be who we are. We're not a danger to them, and so they don't need to do anything to stop us from doing what we want to do, to stop us from existing in society. And that's simply an acceptance versus an assimilative thing. Um, and I see sort of the same thing in a lot of the the vampire stuff where there are i mean there's a wide range in a lot of these vampire stories um, i'm going to poke at true blood for one uh the modern examples of it that i know she cued on as well and that has a range of people who are vampires who want to assimilate you know they want to make everything about their vampiric self go away and they just exist as well as they can within society and there are others who just mm -hmm. they want to be vampires they want to do their vampire thing as long as it doesn't hurt you know, other people and cause problems that way, but they want to not be hunted. Um, and you've got both types. Yeah, and that's exactly and that's always how it case. would be when you're creating a society like that. I have kind of random, um, a little kind of segue. So I kind of want to ask, like, I was, as I was reading this, like the whole idea that we have to be like extra polite to make people think that we're harmless, like in, um, kind of the social justice world there's this term called respectability politics that if someone like has has to be like a certain way in order to be viewed as a person viewed as worthy of basic rights so i'm kind of wondering like what your guys's thoughts are like does that you know if you know if you've read a lot about respectability we have the <laughs> respectability politics like what as I see a relationship between those two things, or kind of a parallel um, that you're asking people, you have to be like extra nice, extra perfect um, in order to be right. worthy. Yeah. Right. If if you're fundamentally changing who you mm -hmm. are just to fit in, is then you're yeah. not changing uh, the way people are yeah. treated. 
Yeah, I've never actually heard that yeah, term before. Yeah, I would look into it because it, it's like, I, I want to know, like, is that the same thing commanding us to like saying you should act this way? Is that our, like almost our version of respectability politics? Like we have to be super nice and hold the door for people and like, to, in order to be worthy, like we all have to be that way or in order to be worthy of not being killed, <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, and it's certainly, uh, it, it's a tactic. It's a way to do that. It's, it's certainly one option and it's one that, at least Jillian seems mm -hmm. to champion, and that's fine. I, I happen to agree in my own personal life, too. I like yeah, to be yeah. nice to people, people, and I like yeah. to be polite, and I like <laughs> to hold door open, doors open for people, but that's that's me. It's not something I would say, oh, everybody has to do that, and if you're not doing that, you're a blight yeah, to our subculture. Like, like right. And that's the thing. I don't think she is necessarily doing, Jillian is doing that either, but it, no. in the way it's interpreted in this in this book, it is kind of... Yeah, because a lot of times, way. like, when respectability politics are brought up, it's like, if a person is not, like, it, I, I guess I could bring the most, the example up, is like, if a woman writing about feminism comes across as, like, too aggressive according to what we think yeah. of women as being that she has to be like nice and she has to like politely ask for her rights mm -hmm. you know her politely ask for fair treatment and so i don't know maybe there's not yeah, not or... a relationship there but like that sort of is what popped into mind like wait are we are we only worthy if we're like super nice all the time you know um and it can well i mean i would be super nice anyways because that's what i think you should do as a person but is it what I have to do to be worthy of rights? You know what I'm saying? So I don't know. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's, it's akin to the victim blaming mm -hmm. mentality sure. where you take someone who is being victimized in some degree and saying, well, you brought it on yourself by, by this way. acting this way, by doing this, by wearing mm -hmm. that, by whatever. And it's, it's your fault rather than the person who actually yeah. broke the law. Um, it's, it's viewing the, the lawbreaker as, unable to control their own urges when provoked in such a impossible to, you know, resist manner. And that is inherently mm -hmm. toxic. And it's, uh, yeah. And I've heard similar things around how uh, society ex says black people should respond to discrimination <laughs> because it's, there's like this thing about black people can't get angry or yell because it reinforces the stereotype of the angry black mm -hmm. person. And but it, it's like that. The problem is with the system, not yeah. with and yeah. The, and I wonder it, with the individual. if that's where it diverges because the discrimination we face. Like I'm not. I don't think it's systemic. <laughs> like I think it can, It depends on where you right. are. Like in some places are where we're not as like alien to people. They're going to be. You're not going to face as many problems as you would in like a culture that's God is still fairly new to, or the the cultural context would be more resistant to it even forty years later. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Chapter five. Uh, she, a, lo a lot of this uh, I kind of glossed over because uh, in, in her previous book, um, she does the same kind of thing where it's a very heavy em emphasis on analyzing stories, uh, describing the themes of specific books um, or comics and uh, extracting those relevant details to kind of build her case. And a lot of this, the media she was referencing, I wasn't familiar with, so I just kind of lost my interest. But saliently, uh, this chapter uh, is where the, the term whimsical macabre is coined. <clears throat> and the whimsical macabre is essentially a combo of creepy and cute. And uh, she goes on to use this as a lens to explore the... Ooh, excuse me, the uh, goth girl archetype. Uh, and I've got a little excerpt here to kind of uh, characterize that. She says, The whimsical macabre, as I define it, is closely aligned with the monstrous cute, although it is not reducible to it. The whimsical, according to Oxford English Dictionary, can. God, I hate when people quote the dictionary in books. But anyway, she says, The, the Oxford English Dictionary can mean subject to or characterized by a whim or whims capricious or fantastic fanciful odd quaint the whimsical macabre deliberately fuses the cute fanciful and quirky with the gloomy gruesome and morbid it brings together images of or associated with childhood often filtered through a retro or neo-victoriana lens 
with gothic and horror iconography to create a gently comic effect. It revels in antique toys, retro suites, vintage childhood clothing, Halloween imagery, circuses, fairy tales, elements of childhood culture that when viewed retrospectively may simultaneously seem sinister and nostalgic. However, none of these paraphernalia are essential requirements. The whimsical macabre is defined principally through its playful, quirky manipulation of gothic style and imagery. So Ruby Gloom, basically. Yeah, she does talk about Ruby Gloom, right. too. Yeah. Yeah, and I, there, I have a lot of contradictory feelings about the like perky goth girl because there's like the the issue of the um, manic pixie dream girl, <laughs> and I kind of wonder if she's a little mm. bit the like darker edge version of that. Only she tends, I think the 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 goth girl that she's talking about tends to serve her own um, purpose. Like she's not just there to like. The difference is that she's not usually attached to somebody or there to like make some guy's life better. <laughs> um, right. So, but and then there's also the issue I thought of like the strong female character and how like I wonder if like this whimsical macabre goth girl is almost like the equivalent of that. Only instead of with strength, it's with happiness and perkiness and like where's the right. other part of your personality right. kind of thing um right. so yeah it's it's very the the, the focus on uh childhood is i think oh, is yeah. problematic especially because she tries to use it uh as another uh part uh, cog in in the machine to to uh support the uh the happy gothic discourse as it relates yeah. to goth culture um and well so yeah i mean and the goth girl she uses the example of jane eyre as an example of the modern goth mm. girl uh, who who she's eternally youthful, uncomfortable in her own skin, yet confident of her difference yeah. and dead set on self-determination. Um, and she says, quote, gothic girlhood in the 90s and 2000s frequently falls into camp, a mixture of the exaggerated, the fantastic, the passionate, and the naive, dealing with heightened emotion, but always mediated through theatricality as if yeah. in quotation marks. and there's like there's a couple of issues in there there's like the issue of like hyper femininity and also the issue of like the infantilization right. of women um right and how like yeah. we're in some cases like we i think a lot of women embrace that um because like when you're in that sort of patriarchal world and you're presented with the these options like these limited options as to what you can imitate and follow and be like sometimes when women are are infantilized to make us seem like less intelligent, less competent, less mature, all that. Um, yeah. You can yeah. kind of, I feel like a lot of women, like she mentions like kinder whore and stuff like that in there, they'll like embrace it in order to cope with it. Um, it's the same with like, um, and that's of course like the kinder whore is also sexualized as well. So there's the embracing of that as right. well. And like the problematic nature of like, this is a full grown woman presenting cunning in like this childish way but and it's either being like presented in a sexual way like with kinder whore and like and the, there's like a whole other level of creepiness and it's not the creepiness they're going for <laughs> there so it's like i don't know i feel like it uh, there's some problematic elements of it from like a feminist point of view and also from like the point of view again of it is she is this goth is this perky goth girl is she a complete person you know like and right Right. I, I really feel like she's kind of the the equivalent of the strong female character or um yeah, and it's just like to me that's you know, it's better, but it's not where we quite need to go. <laughs> it's a step in the right. right direction, but at least we're not all, you know, Nancy Downs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh yeah. I I, mean, I as an aside, we'll get into camp here. I think camp does have some explanatory power, oh, yeah. uh, especially as it relates to um, kind of pleasure aesthetics or how people experience mm -hmm. beauty. Uh, but yeah, again, the, the focus on childhood femininity, Ugh. I think, reduces goth too simply to yeah. that delight and festivity. Yeah, and where you have that kind of intersection of someone is a goth and also a female. Like, it makes the whole like infantilization of you and like the perception of goth being that something that kids do right. and then women being infantilized when you're both of those things it's kind of like people i feel like 
there's a whole level, a whole other level of being looked down on <laughs> there. Cause like something that I've encountered, particularly with men outside of the subculture, when they sort of come into our space for whatever reason, is that there's this like condescension that I get from them that I don't get when I'm not looking like a goth. Um, so like if I'm in professional clothing in my workspace, I get one level of condescension. But if I'm like myself in mm. one of in a goth gothic space where or, or like a goth club where like we have a club here where a lot of people who are not part of the scene are there because we have to kind of share it's a multi-level club with different rooms and so like one room will have one theme one room will have another and then the third one has another so we end up mixing with people outside of the culture a lot and like sometimes men will like come up to me and my friends and there's this like there's this like this like you silly little child thing going on like you can just tell like they're being nice to me on the outward but i but i can tell that in the back of their mind they're like you know i don't even want to know exactly what they're thinking you know because there's a, the hyper sexualized right. stereotype yeah. level as well and so I feel like this kind of, it doesn't lead to that. It like reinforces it, I guess, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I think it also kind of going in the other direction with the whimsical macabre, uh, just to close this out, kind of implies that um, groups like Pastel Goth, Lolita, uh, New Goth, that kind of thing, Sea punk whatever, that those could also be uh included as part of goth mm -hmm. culture or the gothic and that kind of uh messy crossover yeah. there which maybe maybe she's not trying to claim that but i think that fits basically with what she's saying here and that also that adds another problem because m most people even like pastel goths a lot of time will say they're not yeah. goth um but it could be they, those could all be grouped together then. and it's also i think a lot of that <clears throat> is is also kind of representing the same struggle that you have as a woman. You know, I've, I've noticed that a lot of media produced by women, there is that like, there's so many of those elements of like fairy tales and stuff. Like I'm mainly thinking of like Switchblade Symphony, like, cause they have a lot of like mm, yeah. nursery rhyme kind of things. And I always found that kind of peculiar that we right. do that. And I'm like, you know, and I, I just feel like maybe all of that Gothic Lolita and that strain of goth and all of that like i wonder if that's just us struggling with the world like almost like just holding us back and in a way like f forcing us to to almost stay in childhood in certain ways so that's a whole separate topic i could write a book about yeah. that <laughs> so all right so we'll uh we move thus thusly into chapter six uh the main thesis of this i think is uh and again, if I'm if, if if anyone feels like I'm mis misinterpreting what she's saying here, point it out. Uh, but I think the main thesis of this is that um, vampires and other monsters have become funny, furthering her evidence for a shift in modern day gothic. Um, and she starts this chapter by noting <clears throat> that post millennial gothic is partly distinguished by a proliferation of monsters uh, that she suggests have evolved. Or specifically that the sympathetic monster, as you mentioned earlier, uh, has evolved into the assimilative monster. And that these assimilative monsters seek to lessen their otherness, and that lends them to a more comedic and joyful rendering rather than a darker romantic version uh, as seen with the sympathetic monster. Um, and Well, I guess, well, let me ask you this, because my, I don't know if I wrote this down anywhere, but my thought my confusion with this is to me i see vampires as a character that can be applied however you mm -hmm. want it to be applied like it's a really loose you've you've got so many different ways to portray the character and it seems like she's setting it up as more of like a monolithic th kind of i feel thing, like it's kind of like you know you have the sympathetic and the assimilative i don't know if, if they replaced the vampires before as much as they just added more options um right yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like, yeah. i think because like even with the the assimilative vampire we, we're still seeing books that are more than just plain sympathetic vampire and we are still seeing ones that are more monstrous too like like uh she mentions right. um Justin Cronin's uh, Passage trilogy, trilogy, the vampires in that are absolutely 
monsters and they have like they resemble the people that they once were but they turn into almost these like in my mind his description made him look like almost these gorilla nosferatus and it's it's a it's an apocalypse it's a vampire huh. apocalyptic story um and so it there so we're still seeing those yeah did you mention Probably, that last time yes. you were <laughs> yeah because I, I think i remember saying like yeah, oh i want to read that it's a and trilogy <laughs> um they, the last one just came out a, like a year or so ago. I haven't gotten to it yet. I've read the first two, but they're adapting it too. So you'll probably hear more about it. So, but okay. yeah, and she mentions it okay. in here because it talks about like the, how the soldiers are watching the old vampire films to get um, pumped up to go hunt Drax, as they call it. And like, right. I, I love that because it is kind of humorous, but it's also realistic because that's exactly how soldiers think of like, they always have a nickname for the enemy and to call them Drax and then like to have this propaganda essentially like reeling through, you know, I just, I loved that feature in it, but I think she, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a dehumanizing and I think she thing. brought it up to like, say like even the stories that are more serious still have that humor in it. And so, you know, and there's something to that as well. Yeah. 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 She's she said specifically. I think she mm -hmm. brings up Dracula. Yeah. Uh, the newer versions of Dracula, saying that she kind of says that uh, while the, the humor used to happen around the vampire, the vampire itself mm -hmm. was never humorous. So she uses some examples of Dracula. Um, she does, I think, in this chapter talk about talk about yeah. dark shadows. Huh. Um, what uh, what we do in the shadows. Uh, let's see. I have a list here. Vamps. Dragula, Love at First Bite, uh, Charlie and the Chocolate yeah. Factory. I don't know why that's in here. Uh, <laughs> I'm kind of surprised she didn't. Uh, I'm surprised a little bit that she didn't mention uh, Transylvania Six Five Thousand, which was a yeah. pretty fun, is. humorous monster movie that had all the sort of classic monsters, but they were all like <laughs> misunderstood. Um, it was a great. It had Jeff Goldblum in it, of course. So you know, one of those great '80s movies. Um, and it's fun. I recommend going yeah. and seeing that. It, it's another one of those humorous monster movies. It wasn't just vampires because it had Dracula, but it also had the Wolfman and it had Frankenstein and, you know, all the classic MGM monsters um, and you know, having them exist in the real world. Yeah, but I mean, again, I think what I'm and maybe again, I keep thinking like maybe I'm misinterpreting her, but what I would see is that we have a more flexible uh, application of the the archetype rather than a, a shift fundamentally uh, because like we still have modern like we have uh, I wrote a list here uh, perfect creature only lovers left alive Byzantium Dracula untold let the right one in kindred the embrace 30 days of night blade subspecies lots of uh, <laughs> straight to DVD yeah. movies etc that all have the you know use the vampire in all these other different ways it's not we're not only seeing the production of these yeah, i wondered you know because she mentions um she doesn't mention fright night in this entire book yeah or no fright night from like the 80s yeah because that was pretty humorous too but i wonder and and she does mention the lost boys but i wonder yeah. if she's differentiating between like gothic comedy and horror comedy because she does kind of separate horror mm. and gothic at the beginning that's true as serving very different purposes and i i almost wonder if like part of the rise of the happy gothic has to do with um you know maybe at the same time you had like goth like horror comedy introduced so people were like hey we can combine these dark things and make them funny you know it's like horror comedy i think tends to be like more brutal and extreme and um, I was also thinking, too, like, maybe the reason we have more these, like, this lighthearted strain in Gothic because horror has evolved to fulfill the more, like, grotesque side of Gothic. Because um, I feel like Gothic kind of, they kind of, like, branched off from each other, I almost feel like. That, like, horror kind of branched yeah. out from Gothic and Gothic went in one direction and horror went in the other and they just had all these little branches but it's kind of interesting to think about like what the relationship between those two could be and how they're bouncing off of each other because a lot of people who like horror also like gothic and the other way around although sometimes when you put a gothic film out there and you try to make it look like it's a horror movie and horror fans go to see it they really don't like it <laughs> exactly that's the one that i was thinking of because <laughs> yeah. they're like 
and you see that pushback all the time where you the it's almost like Hollywood doesn't know what to do with this gothic film because it's so it, mm -hmm. they come out so sporadically typically that they're like, where do we put this? What do we do with this? You know, and um, so they'll kind of like they do that a lot. Like I've, I sometimes I'll read stuff on on Shutter like people's because they have a gothic horror section on Shutter, and so I'll kind of go through that. And some people I don't I don't think went through <laughs> that way, so they didn't. They were not they were not primed for it to be gothic, so it was much more like toned down than they expected. And there's right. just like complaints, complaints, complaints. Like this wasn't scary at all. Like. <laughs> could have been more extreme no one yeah, was no, it wasn't body horror it wasn't you know <laughs> yeah um yeah so i guess to close yeah. this uh maybe i gotta so but she she brings up also that um the positive what she says are positive elements of the assimilative vampire that it's able to uh create a space for uh queer identities um and that the uh <clears throat> kind of comedic iterations um that subvert the stoic loner type is is a sign of the vampire being regenerated and then the gothic having new life uh breathed into it i think she references uh yeah. rocky horror picture show and dragula um which is which is good and i i like I'm all down. That's why part of why I like her camp uh, a bit, but I mean, it's, it's a, she's trying to build the case here. Um, but I think it's just a, I'm not sure they kind of stack. I'm not sure it, if you put enough of these together, you get correlation. I, I yeah. I Something else that I like find that. interesting that she says, like the, the comedic vampire that we have now leaves space for like, kind of uh, queer interpretations of it. Cause like um, when Interview with a Vampire came out and it's very much not a funny book at all. It's one of the most, probably one of the saddest stories ever written possibly. That book was extremely popular among gay men in the seventies because it was seen as like, um, you know, this is not something I'm saying. This is something other people have said that there was an identi that they identified with Louis and Lestat and not just, you know, because of the vampires, but because it was also like two male vampires being together. And that was pretty much the first time that ever happened too. So, um, and also just the, the, the like sexual interpretations of the vampire bite and the sensuality inherent in it and the exchange of fluids and all that. <laughs> so like, and also then eventually you have the, like the, <laughs> yeah. And then there's Love also the, the AIDS epidemic. There's some interpretations of, of that. You know, because right, yeah. that series, like, was continued. It's still continuing. She just had another one come out a couple, um, a year ago. Yeah, the, the sci-fi oh, yeah, one. Right. <laughs> Which nobody uh, liked, right? Is that how that... I had a lot of feelings about it. <laughs> I <laughs> reviewed it, but okay. that, it's already uh, out there. My thoughts are already right. out there. Well, I do have that, a few so. more... Well, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Trey. I had a couple I've, closing thoughts on yeah, this. Yeah, I had chapter, a few more... Go ahead. A few more comments just on the the humor aspect of things and how she's you know positing that oh because vampires are now allowed to be funny that's some sort of a change in things and i think it's more just how humor works um i mean humor needs to be based on a shared set of imagery that oftentimes needs to be then subverted in surprising ways and that's usually how a joke works so i mean vampires in themselves when they're first introduced as a thing as an archetype it's hard to make that funny because nobody understands what a vampire is. So there's nothing that can be subverted. There's nothing to make a joke on that. There's no right. shared imagery. Whereas once you have an established idiom, right, established yeah. archetype through whether it be Nosferatu, whether it be Bela Lugosi, and she was talking about that evolution of Dracula, how at first, you know, the first portrayal of Dracula was very straight. And then later they started emphasizing some of, some of the things that, Dracula, as the quote straight man said early on, in a humorous manner, in a manner that it was a nod and a wink, but that nod and a wink is only exists because it's re it's referencing mm -hmm. the previous incarnation, right. the, the the archetype that's been set up, and yeah, then you... as far as the resurgence nowadays of comedic vampire things, I think that's more just it's dovetailing with the fact that mm -hmm. vampires became popular again, and so comedy is attracted to yeah. the thing that's in the. You know, in the in the public zeitgeist, 
So if vampires became the popular thing, you're going to have a resurgence of humor about vampires because that gets laughs because people are like, oh, that other movie I saw. Oh, now they're making fun of that. That's right. funny. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of that. Scary movie. The other thing is that you would have right. to evolve how that how it's funny because comedy relies so much on surprise that if you just like did another Dracula parody, mm. you would have how would you make that different? And she talks about how like it's more about the vampires themselves being funny and being kind of making almost making fun of themselves instead of like the humans making fun of the vampires in a kind of way. So it kind of makes sense that we would kind of move away from just that parody to actually like finding the humor in what their lives would really be like, you know, like what we do in the shadows is a great example of that, and, you know? Right. But yeah. what's yeah. the, in con and, and, mm -hmm. She says the opposite of that. I don't have a specific quote, but she says that the vampires becoming funny is a reflection of the mm -hmm. culture of the time, um, not the, like you were saying, Trey, a, a subversion of the expectation because yeah. the expectation was there before. Uh, so she, so it's the op, and I, I, I think you're right now. Yeah. I think she has that backwards. Yeah. Which is what I keep saying. Yeah, because you, mm -hmm. um, I, and I think so, I'm <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then just to close that out, um, she makes reference to uh, Susan Sontag's notion of naive camp in relation to Dracula as a character that proposes himself so seriously and so fantastically that he cannot be taken altogether seriously because he is too much. Um, and she says, or, or I think rather, <laughs> uh, that this is more endemic of goth culture than the uh, sillier, more enjoyment-focused, uh, what she terms as new camp. Um, because uh, that sort of over, like we were saying before, the over-serious, exaggerated performance is something goths have embraced with a wink and a smile and incorporated uh, into uh, self-referential sarcasm and, and into the pastiche of being overly serious to the point of the quote-unquote naive cliché. Um, and I, I don't think that's unique to where we are in goth's history today or to, um, yeah. I think that's continued on through uh, the early days. Uh, she says, in quotation marks, camp sees everything in quotation marks. And I think that's kind of uh, a good way to, a better way rather to explain um, kind of goth cultural humor rather than uh, the new camp um, that she that we've been talking about. So, uh, chapter seven, uh, we are shifting from camp as a tool for reading happy Gothic and a filter, uh, for queer identities and the whimsical macabre as an explanation for the archetypical goth girl to discussing Gothic masculinity. So actually, did you want uh, Natalie, did you want to mention the, uh, yeah, I think it might have actually been in the assimilative vampire um, chapter, but she, um, she kind of. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't want to move on without. Um, uh, there's a section you know. where she, she specifically focuses on the, the sort of recurring thing that you see in a lot of vampire movies and novels, where there is a vampire club that is sort of set up to look like a goth club from the outside or they dress in a way that's similar to goths or sometimes it straight up like is a goth club but it's secretly really a vampire club <laughs> and i i'm trying to like figure out what <laughs> exactly that is <laughs> every every time i go to a new goth club i am hoping it's secretly a vampire club <laughs> but <laughs> you know it because like and I didn't real I didn't realize that like I thought about that and it, that she pointed out that that was kind of a recurring thing because that's something that I hadn't really thought about um, when I was doing all the research and reading all those vampire books, which I, I'm still doing that. Um, it's perpetual. There's just so many of them. So, yeah, and <laughs> oh, there is you God. know, and then like I was thinking about that because in in my novel there is a goth club and one of her like my my main character is not goth she she gets drawn to particular people that she wants to drink blood from basically and one of them is the owner of this goth club and it's kind of a little fantasy thing because it's just a goth club it's not just goth night like i'm imagining it as like 
I call it like serpentine or something and they like it's just goth stuff all the time so and he mm. um you know so she goes to the club and it's an and I was like here I am putting this vampire in the and I'm portraying it like as just a goth club, <laughs> you know, and I thought I was like, what am <laughs> so like, what is, I don't know. Cause I, f I feel like, um, I've always tried to figure out, like, I'm trying to figure it ever since I read that little bit that she said in there, like, what is, what does it mean that it's usually a goth club disguising a vampire club? And then like, now what is it going to mean that I've got this, like, goth club but a vampire is literally going in it to kill someone in it <laughs> so and then the other character one of the other goth characters mm. that i have i gave her those permanent fangs and she like becomes friends with my main character and i'm like you know um mm -hmm. so it's like here's this this goth that kind of like has these and she has her own powers she's actually clairvoyant so this this goth girl and so she um and she's the the owner's sister um so I just thought it was interesting that I found it fascinating that they would, that she would meet this like real vampire and like kind of help her because she can see, you know, she was told to, to go there to kind of help her, but I mean, she would have been there anyway, but anyway, so she, I just thought it was like really interesting. And that kind of like reading that just kind of made me feel like, wow, have I done something different by mistake? <laughs> you know, like it just, you know, because for me it feels kind. It would have felt as a goth kind of fakey to make it like, a, you know, to go along right. with that sort of typical thing. Because there's something about the whole idea that it's secretly a vampire club that kind of makes you feel like, but but where are we? Are we not in this world? Like, where are goths all of a sudden gone now that there's vampires well, here? And so maybe it's a yeah. more realistic way of it. I don't know. And I am going for realistic, so. Yeah, I don't well, know. I don't know. <laughs> I think. I mean, I think part of it is it speaks to, again, her, or, or the emphasis on how the mainstream culture views goths. Because I know even when I was younger, uh, a lot of time went into convincing my parents that I was goth and not obsessed with vampires, oh. uh, because to <laughs> them, seeing because there's so many portrayals of vampires as in a uh, identifiably goth aesthetic to them they it was a you are obsessed with vampires and you're trying to dress like them yeah. not you are a goth and i think that is again kind of the just how yeah. mainstream culture views yeah because i always felt vampires a lot you know time, i always thought it was kind of cool to look at on the screen but i also felt kind of insulted at the same time like do you guys ever feel that way about the mm. you know so yeah but yeah there's i i think like yeah. maybe the maybe this is like a way of like toning down that artifice a little bit. Cause there's something very artificial about it. Not, and I'm mm. not saying it just as like someone who's part of the goth subculture, but like also just, uh, yeah. there's something like unrealistic about that, that you would have this world of vampires and all of a sudden every goth club is really a vampire club. <laughs> I feel like that's not how that, how it actually go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. So we're talking about, uh, goth masculinities in the next chapter. I'll read this little uh, blurb here that kind of gives the overall thesis, um, <clears throat> for what she's getting at here. She says, while there are comic goth women too, they are seldom the focus of the joke to the same extent as goth men. While this is symptomatic of gender bias in contemporary comedy more generally, it also indicates that there are specific qualities to goth masculinities that enable comic identities in a way that goth feminine, femininity does not. Goth comedy often functions around the notion of transformation, the transformation from a mainstream identity to a goth one or vice versa. Uh, see goth to boss. <laughs> uh, this is rooted in the lifestyle concept of the makeover and for this reason, this chapter will also briefly consider the role of goths on TV makeover shows. Goths on makeover shows are frequently, but not always, women, and the gendering of genre in the popular media is highly visible here. For women, goth is constructed as a lifestyle choice, possibly a misguided one, but nevertheless one that fits conventional patterns mm -hmm. of feminine consumption. As I have argued elsewhere, young women in Western culture are expected to experiment with dressing up and shopping for goth clothing and accessories is comparable with more conventional kinds of shopping uh, for women. Uh, for men, 
goth is constructed as something riskier that flouts social expectations and foregrounds the process through which masculinity is constructed. The incongruity of a man wearing eyeliner makes him available for comic representation. His masculinity is potentially travestied in a way that evokes uh, Bakken's concept of the carnivalesque. At the same time, it would be reductive to suggest that goth simply feminizes men. The performance of masculinity for goths is complex and gives rise to a range of responses, comic and otherwise, which I will unpack. So even the, you know, even though she puts that last sentence in there, she, what do you, how do you guys feel about, uh, we've kind of talked about this before in the show, but, uh, goth being more feminine and being, uh, uh where you have a feminine identities that follow more of a, uh, mainstream pa- patriarchal role, whereas men get the, the credit for being the more, uh, incongruous and, uh, uh, uh brave, I guess, for, for being different. I'd say in general, it's it's less the the maybe inherent femininity of goth, and and more it's just sort of the inherent fragility of what makes somebody masculine. It's a pretty restrictive regime, and there's so many things that you just do one thing, and all of a sudden, you're you're totally out. You're not you're not within the the confines of masculinity. And there are a handful of aspects of the goth aesthetic that that break out of that restrictive box. The eyeliner, as mentioned, is certainly one of the major ones, um, or any form of makeup, Uh, long hair, skirts, any non-masculine clothing items, um, breaks that fragility, whereas feminine aesthetics seems to be a little bit more flexible as to what's accepted. There's certainly plenty of ways to, to buck that as well, but you know, you're not as restricted to a very narrow grouping of aesthetic choices mm-hmm. before you are deemed not the gender that you theoretically Yeah, I, I definitely be. think that that's true, that women are encouraged more to experiment with clothing and stuff like that. And then sort of the 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 backhanded part of that is that like fashion and makeup and stuff like that is seen as like inherently like vapid and meaningless compared to everything else. Um, and when women do, um, are sort of there, they are kind of encouraged to step outside of the femininity a little bit, but it's seen as tomboyish and it's supposed to be like temporary that eventually you're just going to grow up and become a real girl at some point. Um, but I definitely think that men, as as far as your aesthetic choices, you are generally much more restricted. Because women are, yeah, like I said, women are encouraged to to experiment with their looks. But anything that's masculine, they're expected to outgrow. Um, but the point is that they're allowed to do it. Whereas, like mm. with men, like boys, if they experiment with femininity, it's kind of it's like don't ever go right. there at all. Don't do that, not even for a minute. You know. Yeah. I had, I had, I distinctly remember, uh, when I was maybe, I don't know, eight, uh, I was fascinated by makeup and nail polish and I kept trying to, to get my, my mom to allow me to just try it on. Cause I thought it was pretty. And there was a huge, we got into a huge argument about her, you know, her telling me that boys don't do that kind of thing. And, uh, it was just really, I remember it being befuddling at the time because i thought it just looks nice why does it why do why can only women wear that why does it matter uh and it was my first kind of introduction to these weird uh yeah (laughs) gender norms that don't make any sense Mm -hmm. uh so i want to read this little part here because i think it's interesting she says virtually all of the representations i will analyze stem from the years immediately following columbine The increase in comic representations of goth masculinities in that period can be attributed to the increased visibility of goth in mainstream media and to the first generation of goths coming of age and becoming comic producers themselves, but also constitutes, I would argue, an important response to that event. In the texts that I will explore, male goths are demystified, their lofty poses brought down to earth, They are transformed from an object of fear to an object of laughter located in an uneasy space between ridicule and heroism. What do you guys think of that? Because I hear people go back and forth on um, uh, goths being demystified through comedy and um, 
I mean, I think comedy is almost invariably a poor way of demystifying because of its strong reliance upon stereotyping. So it's not necessarily projecting a more percent, uh, a more realistic view or a more nuanced view of something. It's picking at those, you know, those outstanding aspects of, of whatever is being, you know, comedically framed and, you know, just poking at those and that's yeah. hard to translate into a way to demystify now is it a way to defang potentially or make something seem less dangerous sure because when something is ridiculous it's hard to fear it as much so in that aspect if you're talking you know you're trying to make goth seem less sinister less threatening um making it the butt of a joke does do that effectively i wouldn't argue i would argue it doesn't do it in a healthy way or in a, in a you know a good long lasting so um, acceptance way but it does defang it and make it not scary as much but so but i mean what i what i don't buy about that is she tries to use these uh mainstream examples of people that are goth or could be uh positioned as goth like uh, Tim Minchin and uh, which I have a lot of issues with because I don't think he's ever portrayed guy. himself as goth. Yeah, she she has a few examples, but I mean, yeah, the thing Noel is, Fielding is definitely he's he's Noel his Fielding, character yes, is I am a goth comedian, <clears throat> and I wouldn't be surprised if he actually was goth or at least had been goth historically. Tim Minchin's just trying to be a rock star. Yeah, um, I don't think he's really portraying himself as goth. He has that song about the dark side, but that was more making fun of like <laughs> grunge and Pearl Jam esque, you know, moody rock star stuff that was all the rage in the '90s. Um, but I mean, he and, certainly and could be goth. He wears poety shirts. He wears an eyeliner. Yeah. But that's again his view of the rock star lifestyle. And I think she kind of says that. My just my beef is just that she doesn't look at any. Uh, subcultural media outlets um, because we do have those <laughs> those exist and this whole you know she she even talks about she closes chapter 8 talking about uh, Whippy Gothic Weekend but other than that which is why I feel like some of this some of the problem here is cherry picking other than that she doesn't really reference the media that goths would actually consume if they want to get a realistic or insider kind of view of goth culture it's all these yeah, i found that interesting too that like when she discusses the comedians she like mentions voltaire and then like doesn't really go into anything that he does that really stood out to me so that would make more sense to focus right. on him than the others um and then to kind of uh at the end of this she t to connect everything back to the happy gothic she uses this contrast between an episode of Home Improvement uh, where the uh, focus is on goth as a more of a violent and angry phase, which was a pre-Columbine, and she contrasts that with a post-Columbine uh, depictions of goth that, uh, like she's been talking about, use uh, goth identities to humorous ends and uh, as kind of a... a a, a cap on on the chapter and i just I, <laughs> there have been shows where where goths have been you know more happy that were made <clears throat> pre-columbine yeah and again you're you you're looking at non-goths interpreting the goth stereotype um like we you know we talked about how we had a problem with uh that film uh uh, where God, I can't remember the names of anything. But at the end, he turns back into a normal person, and it's about uh, oh, the oh. fucking Hangman's Curse. That movie. No, oh God, that's no, a good no. oh, that's a good one though. But the one with the uh, where he this looks must like the be cure. The place. Yes, that one. I think yeah, yeah, that one. And it's you get those kind of incongruencies because you have people making media that aren't part of the culture themselves. You can almost just... make that same comparison with Beetlejuice. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I it's interest like I I wouldn't have as much of a problem if she didn't try to connect it back to goth identities because if you want to talk about the way that the perception of goths have changed in the media, 
over time. I do think she has a case. I do think she has something interesting to say, but as soon as you turn that to um, this is also how goths are starting to view themselves, I, I just don't think that translates. Yeah. So Yeah, this would be solid if that was the case. <clears throat> I agree with that completely. Um, so I'm going to skip that one part here, and we'll just jump into the last chapter, uh, which uh, focuses on Whippy Gothic Weekend and the distinction between... Uh, she starts off talking about the distinction between uh, vulgar tourism and genteel tourism um, as it stands today at WWGW uh, versus in Dracula. Um, the distinction in Dracula was uh, among upper class and lower class boundaries where vulgar tourism um, involved walking and tales of the supernatural for the lower class and genteel tourism represents an appreciation of literature and nature for the upper class. And then what she does is argue that these two types are rectified in the post-tourist model and with the happy gothic and is uh, exemplified by Whitby Gothic Weekend. Uh, so to illustrate this, she presents the dichotomy of two attractions at, uh, that you can find at Whitby Gothic Weekend. The first is the uh, tourism at the Abbey, which is uh, that big uh, cemetery and, and building on the, on the cliffside, where they focus on a historically accurate and ecclesiastical exploration of literature and heritage. And then, oppositely, you have the Dracula experience, which foregrounds its presentation in the supernatural, the fantastical, and a effective experience of horror. <clears throat> and what she does in the end there is argue uh, that both of these and the other experiences at, Whitney, at Whitby become inauthentic and post-tourist uh, because they are both uh, kind of a pastiche and they are appreciated by everyone, goth, non-goth, upper class, lower class, whatever. Um, so she says, in contemporary culture, Hogel suggests that this process is allied to the Baldriard procession of simulacra so that the industrial detachment of the commodity from its historical referent and its duplication and circulation eventually becomes a post-industrial realm of free-floating signifiers. And basically what she's saying is that uh, at Whippy Gothic Weekend, whether you are trying to pursue a more authentic experience, a uh, more historical experience, or a more fantastical experience, uh, that accuracy still goes out the window in favor of entertainment. And um, the sort of gothic ephemera becomes a stylistic buffet that everybody can pick from and can context and authenticity doesn't really mean anything. And this is representative of modern Gothic literature and goth subculture. She's trying to, to show that again, what she started with in the, the beginning of the book, authenticity um, is not a thing. That everything is is the ghost of of the past and uh, just a, a simulacra. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Otherwise, we can jump into the goth specific portion of this. Um, was Whitby Gothic Weekend ever intended specifically <laughs> for members of the goth culture, and did it change, or was it always meant for just everyone? Uh, yeah, so she kind of addresses... So originally, yeah, it was, I think. Um, and there's this debate about whether or not it's actually goth or not anymore. There was even a, a paper, somebody wrote a paper about this, um, where they said... I can't remember. I think it was Sprecklin and Sprecklin. And they said that um, because Whitby Gothic Weekend has become so uh, advertised and has become such a... Uh, tourist draw that like the the actual city promotes it because they they make money mm -hmm. that it has become kind of the uh costume where people just dress up and play a part rather than being a authentic uh goth event and that's what she's trying to set up here in her argument is that everything is inauthentic and you can't make that distinction between 
what is actually part of goth and what is the tourist dressing up and enjoying it. That kind of lifestyle gothic becoming goth lifestyle. Yeah, the kind of the problem that I see with that is like everything being derivative of itself. Sometimes when people talk about cultural appropriation and people resist it, they're like, well, cultures, they all evolve and they all change and they all borrow from each other. And then the pushback is that like, and that gets a lot of pushback, of course. And I feel like that's almost kind of what she's saying here. Like if it was just aesthetics, like she was just talking about the Gothic, that's one thing that, that should kind of evolve. But to like say, oh, well, because it's not, um, well, because it, it's derivative and it had influences or it was revivalist or whatever. I'm not sure if that really justifies it. Um, I'm trying to remember like how people use, usually contradict that argument that, well, you know, cultures always borrow from each other. Yeah, I don't, um, I don't know how to contradict yeah. that argument, honestly, because I've, yeah. it's something I've trying to, been trying to think about recently. Because uh, she yeah. talks about revivalist, got the Gothic as a revivalist movement and Goth as revi and I don't know how you rectify those two things. So I think a lot of times they'll say, you know, well, it, it depends on what you're, what you're taking and how you're taking it. And, or sometimes it, a lot of it is, is it being offered to you by people from the origin culture? Um, but I think that's kind of what it is. Like, it's very complicated. I've been reading about cultural appropriation a lot, especially since I'm getting into to belly dance. It's a really high concern in that community. So I, I keep a, an eye on the, that conversation the wider conversation as well as the one that's happening within like belly dance and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, like, is that, cause I felt the whole time, like I was thinking, you know, okay, she's focusing very much on like the aesthetics of goth, but this is also a group of people that it's our identity and like, well, yeah, I mean, if people are just like taking from it to borrow from it. You know, I mean, I don't think it harms us specifically. I don't really right. I don't think, think it does matters, in yeah. our case. So like, but, part of, I mean, part of the focus yeah. on the aesthetic is because going back to the Burton chapter is the argument that goth the has visual. become more visual. And so that's yeah. the main, where the main substance is. Yeah, exactly. But, and yeah. Mark, going back to just, because I remembered, uh, she actually briefly brings up that paper. She doesn't really talk about it too much. She just kind of dismisses it. Uh, the paper about uh, goth being, a, uh, or, or, Whippy Gothic Weekend being a tourist attraction and kind of a dress up yeah. thing. The only specific way she addresses that is by saying that asserting, making that assertion dismisses the political nature of goth and that the best way to understand goth culture is through the discourse with mainstream uh, culture and, the, and then this kind of idea of <laughs> everything is inauthentic. Uh, but I again, was... how about just asking goths? <laughs> it's just yeah. like I thought it was. I just thought it was weird because that was the I, that paper popped into my head as I was reading this, and then she mentions it. I don't know if she 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 must cite it somewhere, uh, but she says it's it dismisses the political nature of goth, and like even if we agree that goth is political to a to a degree, I'm not sure that. That's a argument against. Is she referring the to like uh, scene politics? <clears throat> no, uh, like, or actual politics, like the the trying to legislate hate crimes kind of thing. Oh, right. becoming. Um. So I don't. I don't even really understand what she was trying to get at there. I don't have the exact page that. It, uh... Let me see if I have it right here. But I thought it was weird, because that was my my thought. Especially when you see photos from Whippy Gothic Weekend, you can kind of tell. Um, she like so she references um, the Gangnam Style and the hashtag selfie parody videos uh, as part of that she calls it the gothic carnivalesque where uh, the morbid concerns of the monster are co-opted into a comic uh, and regenerative vision that is informed by camp um, and then she goes on to say that um, Whippy Gothic Weekend offers a complex range of pleasures uh, which in her mind translate into the happy gothic and that she specifically says that allows for steampunk, uh, the costumed tourist, and the traditional goth to all jumble together. Which again, I think is 
I think what she's trying to do is is to reference back to goth as a consumer driven middle class kind of culture, and that because we consume the same lifestyle uh ephemera that somehow makes us all part of the same thing, and it just doesn't it just doesn't it's too yeah. it sounds too close to the kind yeah. of post subculturalist view where everything is culture is just a buffet of of stuff you can pick from and it's a uh the cultural milieu just kind of shifts and moves at, at, at will and identities are transitive and and it just it just doesn't work i think in explaining anything <laughs> right yeah it was not really fully sold on the connection between goth and gothic for most of this book yeah it really just wasn't <laughs> Um, so, well, yeah, any other thoughts on, uh, Whippy Gothic Weekend or anything in this chapter, or we'll move into, uh, our just general thoughts, uh, on the book overall. Is there anything we, you guys wanted to bring up that I didn't uh, touch on or? I mean, it sounds like a fun experience. I can say that much. It's, it's definitely different. It's definitely an interesting read. Uh, it bring it. Yeah, well, so I'll get, yes, so to kind of uh, uh, close on the book as a whole and and kind of try to organize my thoughts into how I felt about the book, um, again, my, my biggest problem here was uh, too much methodological reliance on what I said earlier, this seemingly coterminous relationship between Goths and the Gothic uh, that were conflated. Um, I also have a problem with the reliance on mainstream interpretations of goth and an overemphasis on that excuse me discursive relationship being the lens through which we can interpret goth culture um part of why a lot of goths will argue for goth as a culture rather than a subculture is to kind of avoid this and um what we have in this book is uh the notion of kind of goth identity being reliant on mainstream interpretation or appropriation, um, where rather I would say goth interpolates outside cultures and structures to its own, through its own philosophical aesthetic, uh, through kind of that uncanny uh, uh, lens. Um, you know, while I, I feel this book suffers from some cherry picking. Um, I, I would like to say I don't feel it's dismissible. And I think there is some value to the book, especially when discussing uh, the Gothic and modern Gothic storytelling. I think that's where it really shines. Um, I also think the whimsical macabre is a, can be a useful tool uh, when explaining elements of the Gothic. Um, not so much when you look at goth, though. Uh, I enjoy her gothic carnivalesque and camp modalities as a way to explore gothic art uh, and especially to empower queer and feminine identities. Um, let's see. This is most useful and powerful when she is discussing, discussing mainstream adoption and the general cultural shift in the way that gothic is used and interpreted. However, however I feel it's, again, too much of a stretch to correlate this with goth proper. And it runs aground of missing out on the homology of goth, which is my view, the uh, multiple elements that come together. The gothic is, I think, only one of the necessary and sufficient elements uh, that create a goth identity and goth culture. Uh, whereas if you just have the gothic, um, it might be necessary, but it's not a sufficient element to explain everything. Um, where I think her argument is the strongest in parallel to the Gothic is uh, the revivalism uh, thing that we, we talked about. Uh, although I would argue that that is used to take something that's implicitly inauthentic and make it authentic in a new context, whereas she, she argues that um, it's the inauthenticity is what gives it, gives it its strength in the first place. Um, and so let's see, last a little bit here. What this book shows is that if we tie every aspect of goth to the gothic, we end up with a problematic model that stretches a bit beyond its ability to explain modern day goth culture. 
because while they share inspirations and more substantive schools of thought, they are not coterminous. That said, I think this book succeeds both as a fun read and as a tool through which to explore and examine the evolution of goth culture, and especially the gothic. I think that's where it's the best. Um, I, I do think this issue is deserving of more discussion, and uh, I do think the book was well-researched and thought-provoking uh, and can be used to help readers kind of come away with a clearer understanding of where they stand on the issue and maybe think about uh, aspects of it that they hadn't before. And that's kind of my concluding thoughts on the book. Yeah, I, I agree <laughs> with a lot of that. I learned, um, there was a lot that I, I learned reading this book as far as about the the evolution of the gothic, and I feel like I have a much clearer picture in my mind of that evolution than I did before. Um, you know, like I said, I studied mostly horror, so this is really helpful for me. Right. Um, so, but yeah, I, I was never... I never quite understood what what it had to do with goth the whole time, no. um, except through a lot of like coincidental shifts in the perception of us um, and how we're portrayed in mainstream culture. Mm -hmm. But um, she does acknowledge that it's not like this is not kind of a hard cutoff thing. Like this is this is where gothic is now, and all of it is like that. And I really appreciated that she acknowledged that there's still, you know, other types of gothic that still exist, and that seemed to imply to me that this is really just like another option if you're gonna go look for something to read or look for something to write, something to watch or um, film yourself, you know, whether you're a creator, a member of the audience, like we have more choices. Of course, I think the happy gothic trend has um, faded since she was writing this book. Um, but that being said, I think it probably, you know, that the particular phase that she's talking about where it reached its peak in like 2012, I think that's going to leave an imprint um, for a long time because now we're going to have a lot of um, people who grew up reading Twilight and the Southern Vampires and all that um, possibly growing up to create their own stuff or at some point being uh, members of an audience that are being peeled to oh, through like a retro oh, we're going to go back to the Twilight era or something like that at mm -hmm. the future um, you know and so you know, I kind of, I, I'm definitely in support of what, of most of what she says as far as like analyzing the actual films and TV shows and um, at least the ones that are stories. I can't really speak about the, the like reality TV ones, uh, but it all made sense to me. Um, and there, there, like I said, I think there are other kind of factors that may have contributed to like the rise of happy gothic. I think, you know, there was she's very right in saying that there's always been these comedic and romantic elements in Gothic. And it just kind of slowly went up over the last 150 years until it reached this really high peak. And then people just like got sick of it and now they're hmm. moving on. But that's, that's just kind of how that happens. You know, um, it may come back at some point, but you never know. Um, may, if we're in for a horror boom, like a, suspect we might be, yeah. but uh, people may tire well, of that and want something. A lot of tickets. What's that? It just sold a lot of tickets. Yeah, so. a lot. An unbelievable amount. It's mm -hmm. awesome. And yeah, I was so pleased with that movie. Um, but it's a separate topic. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and I, I found this really helpful to read as a writer as well. Mm. So yeah, yeah. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I mostly concur a lot as well in that, you know, I agree that she was definitely in her depths when she was talking more about the evolution of gothic as a literary movement, as an artistic <clears throat> movement, as a producer of media and entertainment. Um, there's definitely uh, more information she had in that, more interesting things she had to say. Um, as far as involving the goth subculture, I almost want to say that was more because she was trying to posit the you know tragic events at the end of the previous millennium in her post-millennial hypothesis in that she was trying to say that something happened immediately prior to the turn of the millennium to make gothic need to have this happy movement and her her precipitating events were you know the sophie lancaster mm -hmm. uh, response which was a response in turn to the columbine massacre 
and because both of those events were pretty much exclusively revolving around the goth subculture, not around gothic uh, literary movements or you know or media movements. In order to hypothesize those, she had to merge the goth subculture with the gothic. Otherwise, how could something happening to the goth subculture have anything to say about changes within the gothic? Mm. So I think she kind of forced her hand with that hypothesis or with that precipitating event. And you know, I also disagree with a lot of the way she was characterizing goth in in any sort of sense that it changed dramatically with that event, other than it got a spotlight shine shown on it so that there needed to be a response. It needed to be a reaction when the subculture elements of the subculture are being questioned by reporters and being stopped and frisked by police officers. There's a response to that. And there are lots of different responses that people had. You of course have Jillian Vinter's response towards the, the manners aspect of things and that's one response. And then there's the legal response from the UK involving, you know, legislating against hate crimes and trying to get the Gothic subculture to be protected in the same ways that uh, sexuality is protected in the same ways that various racial identities or religious identities are protected, um, giving it a standing equivalent to some of these other uh, cultural groups. So all of that while it happened, it's not like all of a sudden what is we used to be a dour subculture is faking this happy thing just to make us seem normal. We're not mainstreaming ourselves. We're not trying to divorce ourselves. Exactly. We're not trying to divorce ourselves from those aspects that prior to those events made us goth. We're simply explaining that, no, we're actually real people deserving of these rights because we don't, we aren't just this cardboard cutout of the goth stereotype. We also have all of these other aspects of our life and we're living our lives and we're being productive members of society and we're, we're doing what we do and that should be respected and should be acknowledged because what we're doing is not keeping other people, not infringing on other people's ability to live their lives. We're simply doing our own thing. We want to be left alone and not persecuted in, in an excessive way. Mm. So, I mean, I think that's more the response in the goth. And there had been, you know, plenty of examples of whimsical macabre throughout the entire history of the goth. And then I guess the secondary strange thing that struck me most in the book was that while she's her premise is that this whimsical goth is a post-millennial thing, positing it's a newer thing, but then she explains in numerous occasions through multiple chapters all of this pre-millennial content within the gothic, both literature way back at its inception and then through the, the movies and all of that, where there are examples of whimsical and happy goth historically throughout, which I felt kind of undercut her her premise that this is something new it seems that it's just always been there it's just now it's being noticed so i don't know yeah i was kind of thinking about that too because i was like when i before i read this book i was like well what about the adams family and all those guys to say that it's new i wonder if it just like you know reached a peak or you know if it was the industry strings saying you know here's this phenomenon you know i think mainly the thing that led to this like latest boom was uh, was definitely twilight and if the industry was just like okay let's find more people who are making stuff like this and let's hire more people to make stuff like this and let's just saturate the market and then it's gone you know and i kind of i kind of wonder if that's it or if it was just like something that took time to build momentum for people to really want it and understand it if that if it just took you know all those decades for people to warm up to it or something especially like i'm thinking mainly since like the, you know you know mid-century kind of mid-century forward but you know because a lot of people you know still enjoy stuff from that earlier era where she talks about like you know the adams family and i'm also thinking of the monsters and like vampira and people still look back on those and then of course we had kind of almost a, a revival of Vampira with Elvira, who she mentions, but um, there's the issues behind that. But yeah, I almost kind of wondered like what was 
her thoughts on like why why now but of course she sort of said the the political stuff and i wonder if maybe those things weren't created to make political comments as much as they sort of just primed uh the popular culture to be mm. to be able to understand happy gothic including happy goth characters that they needed that 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 reaction from our community it's for these perky goth characters for instance to even make sense to them you know what i'm saying does that make yeah. sense yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. Or, yeah. or just the, yeah. the mainstream culture spotlight coming on oh all of a sudden goth is in the news so mm -hmm. now we talk about it yeah yeah I, I would have thought that sort of the the peak at least in terms of like movies of you know the happy goth would have been the early 90s because that was when Tim Burton had his, uh, like, a big boom of uh, movies. You know, you had uh, uh, yeah, Edward Scissorhands and... Uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, Night Corpse right. yeah. Bride. Yeah, plus, you know, Adam's Family, Adam's Family Values, yeah, Hocus Pocus, back. Casper, you know, oh, yeah, all these cute yeah. little, yeah, you know, right. yeah. uh, movies like that. You're yeah, even, like, maybe just the... The like comedic because she kind of addresses two different strains there's the romantic yeah. and then the comedic and i wonder if that was like the the peak for like the comedic and then like twilight and true blood and and all those were like the peak for the romantic side of it the i do romance really like this element of it sorry no oh, no that's fine I, I do really like the the way this book is structured though i think i the way it, like you can each chapter adds in a something additional onto the thesis, but they mm -hmm. all tie together. Uh, I think that's because I've started working on an outline for a book, and I'm gonna kind of do it that way. So I really appreciate the way she. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I definitely, I definitely appreciated the craft of the book. It was well written. It was well researched. My main issues is I, I have a, a disagreement with her premise, um, and so I think the the premise was flawed in my opinion, and uh, I think some of the cherry picking that you had mentioned was necessary to yeah. make that premise true um whereas if it was a stronger premise i think the cherry picking would have been less necessary and there could have been more uh a, a broader range of example and maybe some counter example thrown in there as well that you know could have been disproven thus to emphasize the thesis even more yeah so uh in closing i guess i would uh suggest that uh i would actually suggest people pick this book up if you have the money uh just because there's some stuff we didn't talk about. There's some nuance in there and just to see what you think about it and see, uh, kind of get your own perspective on it. Uh, cause my concern, you know, don't, don't take our critical review as the end all be all, you know, check it out and see what you think. And especially her previous two books. Uh, I actually might would probably recommend more, uh, those being, uh, contemporary Gothic and, and fashioning gothic bodies uh, contemporary gothic where like we were saying in this book where where she shines is focusing on the gothic and that book is almost exclusively about uh, gothic storytelling and i think that is a really really good book and fashioning gothic bodies is all about uh fashion <laughs> as the title would suggest so i'll have links to those in the show notes if you would like to check them out uh so thank you all for uh coming on and for <laughs> not just coming on the show but actually reading an entire book and <laughs> analyzing it uh, i really appreciate all the extra work uh that you guys put into uh to doing this it was uh... i enjoyed it this is super helpful i'm i'm, I'm really glad that i got to read this book awesome cool yeah, it's like... thanks thanks for coming on guys mm -hmm. thank you thank you I know this was a bit of a different show. I usually like to keep a lot of variety throughout the show, but we will be back to our normal schedule next month. And if you're looking uh, for some extra content uh, with a bit more variety, you can check out the YouTube channel or you can uh, sign up on the Patreon page at uh, patreon.com slash cemetery confessions. Next month, we're going to be back with an episode about goth youtube and our guests that month will be angela benedict and Skullgirdle, two youtubers i have a lot of respect for thanks again for hanging out with us this month i apologize again for my cold um but if you'd like to get in contact with us you can send an email to cemeteryconfessions at gmail.com 
uh, or you can uh, hit us up on Patreon if you're a Patreon member. So thanks again. Until next time, stay dark. The preceding program is a member of The Belfry, a network of blogs, podcasts, and videos for the darkly inclined. Go to thebelfry.rip for more information. I wonder if this will work without Mark being in here. But I realized that uh, even though I liked parts of it, all of my most of my commentary is critical. Yeah. And so I hope the author doesn't get pissed off because I like her a lot. But no, there's a lot of there's a lot of valid stuff in here too. And she's looking at it through a very specific and focused lens. So like mm. some of it is from my critique was like coming from kind of a different perspective. But I guess that's maybe kind of a good thing that I'm on here. To get yeah, that no, it's point I, of view. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Trey, go ahead. I was gonna say she does try to make a real good point throughout the whole book of distinguishing that she's discussing gothic as far as her background in the literary genre and stuff versus commentary on goth culture. Okay. See, because I felt like she drew a lot of parallel. I guess we'll get into it, but I'm, I'm hoping as I was reading through it, I was, I felt because I read this book one and a half times and I felt like I may have been, um, misinterpreting what she was saying so hopefully you guys can uh mark are you do you have head uh yeah can you hear me yeah okay it just uh, there's a little echo but that's okay um so i have a quick question what does it mean that someone is a reader in literature and culture is that a uk term because i'm not familiar with that did anyone figure that uh, out uh where did it say that she's it's just in her her um bio on the back of the oh yeah is a reader in literature and culture yeah. She's a professor, professor in that thing at that university. <laughs> yeah, because that's not so, how I've never seen it referred to that way. Because I know here, like, we have English oh, yeah, literature and then we have creative writing. And I know the differences between those two. I'm guessing the separation is probably pretty similar in the UK. No, as it they're is a here. bit backwards over there. It's all... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trey, I, I know, was it gonna... almost made her sound like a professional scholar, too, which would be really cool. To yeah, know. right. Yeah. yeah. Like a some kind of wizard or something yeah <laughs> uh trey i wanted to ask you if uh before we started just randomly if you were planning on if you had a cbs subscription to watch the new star trek uh, series i don't <coughs> didn't even know when it was coming out I... oh are you serious yeah it just uh i don't know if the first episode is out yet discovery is that, but, is that what uh, it is star trek discovery i think so yeah I've been seeing a lot of uh, ads for it recently. They announced, I think they announced it like a year and a half ago, but um, it's either coming out or just came out. And I knew you were a big Star Trek fan. So Which one I of am, my, but I don't have a television or any <clears throat> TV, so I don't get those. It's a, it's a, it's a, so CBS made their own streaming channel. So you right. have to pay a subscription and you can stream it on your computer or whatever. I'll definitely look into it. Yeah. My or PlayStation, I, if you uh, have it, you can always also use that. Nope, not so much. Just a computer. <coughs> Skeptic's Guide to the Universe is doing a spin-off podcast for the new series, so that kind of got me excited about maybe torrenting nice. it or something because I'm not going to pay for another subscription. Another random channel for one more show. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark, can you turn yourself down a little bit, a smidge? My my uh, audio, you mean? Yeah, if you have it on your mixer. Okay, just let I've, me know uh, when it's like at a good level. Yeah, that's good. 